<laughs> You're welcome. I was scrambling on this meeting. <laughs> and it wasn't the one that came in really close to the start. And it's like, yeah. <laughs> is there a new piece of correspondence, Rebecca? There is. It's regarding item 5B. I, uh, you'll see it in your email. Look who's sitting in the front row here. <laughs> I'm about to dip. But made it. pleased to see you. I'm here when you're when the rest of the crew is available. Hello, hello. Testing, testing. Hi, we're hearing you perfectly. Thanks. Uh oh, I'm not hearing anything. Oh, we hear you. Oh, there we go. Okay, all good. Hi, everybody. Hey there. Hey there. Mm -hmm. Hello. <sighs> See, we're waiting for John. Oh, and I, um, Alex or Parker, if you can re-identify Robbie as John Mazza. Hmm. There you go. There you are. I don't know why this happens. I've been, that's been my email for 25 years. Um, <laughs> before gotta... the next meeting, I'll have Alex or Parker talk to you about how, like, what account you need to, what Zoom account you should be logged into before the start of the meeting. I think that's where we're going okay. sideways. I think it's the haircut that did it. Yeah. yeah. My semi-annual. <laughs> Rebecca? Yes? Do we have the fellows from, or whoever it is, um, Public Safety Commission? Oh, I think. Yes, Luis. Uh, yes. The there He's he here. is. Luis okay. Flores. Very good. The other city staff on there. Okay. Okay, we're we ready. Got Enough people here to play, right? Mm-hmm. All right, here we go. Good evening, friends and neighbors. I would like to call over the Malibu Planning Commission regular meeting of May 15th, 2023. This meeting is being held teleconference by teleconference due to the COVID-19 pandemic. I hate reading that. Commissioners and city staff are participating in this Zoom meeting from remote locations. All votes will be taken by roll call. Members of the public can participate in the meeting or watch it by going to malibucity.org front slash virtual meeting. At that screen, click on one of two tabs to either watch or to sign up to speak on particular items. Those wishing to speak must be present in the Zoom meeting to be recognized. Please sign up before the item has been called by the chair. Those wishing to defer time to someone else intending to speak are not required to sign up, but must be present in the meeting. If instead of speaking, you wish to donate your time to another speaker, please click, click the raise hand button at the bottom of the Zoom screen when the public hearing for the item is opened. A speaker may accept up to one or up to five additional minutes, one minute each from each speaker that defers time for a maximum total of eight minutes. Alex, would you please show our terrific slide? There it is. Everybody sees that. Commissioners, when you have comments, please raise your hand and I will call on you in turn so we can make our discussion clear for the record and the public. May I have a roll call, please? Commissioner Hill. Here. Commissioner Jennings. Here. Commissioner Peake. Here. Vice Chair Mazza. Here. Chair Smith. Here. You have a quorum. Terrific. Um, okay. Uh, Approval of the agenda. Uh, I may I move that we approve the agenda as staff recommends with item 3B1 continue to 61623. I'll second that. Vice Chair Mazza? Yes. Commissioner Hill? Yes. Commissioner Jennings? Yes. Commissioner Peak? Yes. Chair Smith. Yeah, I was going to ask about making a change. I wanted to, I guess it's too late. I should have spoke up. Uh, yes. Motion carries. 
Okay. I would have entertained a, a, a uh, amendment. Okay, thank you. I, well, I was thinking for the, our fellow commissioners on the safety commission, maybe we can move the parking lot up for them. So we make sure we get that done for them. Is that something that everybody would consider? Okay, I will make a motion to amend the uh, previous motion to make. Which one's the parking lot? It's uh, actually 5A, so it follows uh, the consent calendar. Oh, well, then we don't need to move it, do we? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. We gave it a pretty high priority. The amendment. Okay. <laughs> okay, then we're good to go here. Um, report on the posting of the agenda. The agenda for the meeting was properly posted on May 5th, 2023. Terrific. Thank you. No ceremonial presentations yet, but maybe one of these days. You never know. Uh, written and oral communication from the public. Rebecca, do we have any fine folks from our fair city that want to speak with us? I am trying to get, for some reason, my tech is stalling. Just a moment, please. Um, we do have somebody signed up under 2A. Um, he, huh, he is an applicant for an item that we've just continued, um, or the owner rather for that item. Could I ask for a point of clarification, Patrick, since that item was just continued, is he able to speak in this meeting? So, I mean, if he is here he, he, in, and that item is one of the purview of the Planning Commission, he is allowed to comment on it. Okay. Um, then, Duco Murray. Let me see if I see. If you're present in the meeting under another identity, if you could click the raise hand button. And anyone else who is not signed up but wishes to speak on an item within the Planning Commission's purview but not agendized for the meeting, please click the raise hand button now. There you go. Um, and James, are you wishing to speak on something other than your own application? Otherwise, if you could so lower, you your, lower hand. your hand. <laughs> no, no, obviously, sorry. I wasn't sure if I was supposed to click that or not, but I'll, um, I'll lower it now. Thank you. Thank um, seeing none. And I'm sorry, Dennis, I'm I'm not seeing any other oh, okay. members right. of the public. I think you're uh, ready to move forward. All right, thank you. Um, hey guys, uh, commissioner's comments, planning commission, and then we'll go to Richard. Anybody got anything? All right, Ms. Uh, Vice Chair Mazza. Yeah, just a quick question. Um, is the training still on for the same day as the motel, which I believe is the 31st? Yes, it is. Okay, and second question is, now that uh, COVID's been nationally said, said to be over, when do we go back to non-COVID stuff? Um, that is at the discretion of our city council. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Hill. Yeah, good, good evening, everybody. A uh, couple things. The first, this is a small thing, but one of the projects we got had about four times as many sheets as usual. Most of them were construction plans, things like the diaphragm nailing schedule and the anchor bolt details and stuff that we don't necessarily be, need to be concerned with. So um, it, it's a lot of stuff to read through that it's not really pertinent and we could save a few trees if we tried to get the packets to the relevant size. Um, <clears throat> secondly, Recently, I disclosed an ex parte communication as required that I got a phone call from an agent of an applicant who offered me a quid pro quo. And of course, I rejected it immediately. And I thought that was the end of it, but some folks had other ideas. So to be clear, there's no personal aspect to this. I don't know the man other than I'm aware he makes comments to counsel from time to time. I don't believe I've ever met him. Um, then last week, the local paper published an article contrasting my ex parte disclosure with his false disparaging statements about me, which the writer didn't share with me prior to publication for clarification or rebuttal or anything. So for the record, 
I reaffirm my disclosure and note that statements made by the applicant's agent about me and the situation are false and defamatory. And so fair notice, if any such attacks on my character continue, I'd be compelled to pursue legal remedies. And finally, thanks to everybody who's expressed faith in my integrity. And that's my comments. Okay. Commissioner Peak. No comments. <laughs> Commissioner Jennings. Okay. Um, I've got one, and I think it's uh it, it's a it's a really wonderful thing here. I want to uh mention uh Dylan Rem's name. He was a National Merit Scholarship winner, uh one of our own uh young people here at the high school, uh one of 2,500 out of 15,000. And uh I read that and I thought, well, that's just terrific. This is our young people moving up around here, and we like to see that, of course. And he's going to start study geography, and that's something I actually like. I think I actually got a decent grade in that. But um, so, congratulations to Dylan Rem. He is uh, he's a National Merit Scholarship winner, and the best to him. Okay, guys, uh, Director Malika, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, just two things, very or three things, very quick. Uh, I want just to let everybody know that we are aware of MRCA's work letters they've been sending homeowners up on Murphy Way. I've got our code enforcement staff looking into it as well as one of my contract planners. So we're looking to see, you know, just if what they're doing is right. So somebody in the city is working on that. I, I also just wanted to re reiterate that on the tower at the college, uh, Tyler uh, did follow up with the applicant about their submittal materials last week. We're going through those. We're keeping them on tight deadlines to, to make sure they don't fall off there since that conditional use permit needed uh, to be uh, completed prior, needs to be completed prior to city sign off. And lastly, just to make it very clear that the planning department, we are unable to say that they have satisfactory, satisfactorily met the conditions of the CDP that was issued by the city. And I say that because one of the conditions was that they obtain a CUP for the use of the tower. And then also there's the question of color and height. So all of those are things that I, I just want to be clear that the department is requiring that these conditions of uh, the resolution, I forget the number, be complied with prior to the city signing off that CDP. So that won't happen. Now, the uh, certificate or, uh, oh gosh, what do you call it? Uh, the C of O, uh, Certificate of Occupancy, that's not handled by the city, that's handled by the state. I am trying to coordinate to find out where they are with that uh, such system. Um, it's a three-step process. Apparently, they've started the process, but I would like to try to find some way to make the state aware of the city's concerns. And then also, I wanted to just publicly congratulate three of our staff, um, Fletcher, Allen, Allison Myers, and uh, Sam Elias. Uh, the three of them have been promoted to assistant planner. We also put a few other offers out there to folks. I am still waiting on hearing back. I hope the uh, a couple of people we offer jobs to do accept them. So want to congratulate our three internal folks on their promotion. They did very well in the, in the interview panel. Uh, we, and we've hopefully we'll get a couple bodies in. Uh, so you start seeing some other faces around here. And it's not just uh, <laughs> the two seniors and the, the four planning techs. Oh, excuse me, there's one assistant in there or associate. So trying to get some bodies in the room. Uh, Commissioner Mazza, uh, Vice Chair Mazza. Yeah, I just wondered if the city hasn't given a C of O and the state hasn't given a C of O, uh, why is it occupied? I, I asked that question too, and what I was told, and this is why I'm trying to fact check with the state, apparently the, there's, as I mentioned, a three-step process, and because they started that process, the project manager uh, from SMC explained they could then start using the building. So I'm, a, I'm guessing, I hate to assume things, that might be the equivalent of like when the sometimes we as a city give folks a temporary CFO 
uh, while we wrap up the last remaining items on their house. Perhaps that's what they have from the state. Uh, but apparently the state is aware that they're that they are occupying the building. Thank you. And that concludes my comments. Thank you, Chair. Great. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Thanks for that. Um, okay, I guess we'll go to uh, see previously discussed items. We don't have any. We have new items. These are extensions that just got moved. So I believe we go right to 5A. Am I correct in this? Hey, uh, Dennis? Yes, sir. Um, the gentleman that was supposed to speak during public comment has his hand up. I think that he got clicked off and then clicked back on. I don't know if you want to hear from him or not. Oh, Mr. Murray, huh? Is that who you're you're referring to, I guess? Um, I, yes, yes. I'm, I'm fine with that, of course. Uh, can we unmute Mr. Murray? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Great. Thank you so much. I'm sorry I had a bit of IT uh, trouble. Um, so, yeah, I'm the owner of uh, 5263 Horizon Drive. Um, the, re the request was for an extension of our uh, planning, our planning um, approval. Um, and I'm just trying to understand why, why we've been bumped another month. Um, all of our paperwork should be in. Um, Jessica, uh, is it Bibbits? I know she's, I've been emailing, emailing her, but she's apparently left the city now. I went into the city this morning. I was told that Arkash Shah was our new planner, contacted Arkash Shah. He knows nothing about this. Um, I'm just very frustrated by the process. It's great to hear from um, Richard Malika that you guys are hiring more planners. Um, but the, the slowness in which our case is being handled, and I'm sure part of it might be my expediters as well aren't doing their job, but I'm just, I feel like I'm banging my head against a wall. Um, I'm asking for questions as to why we've had another delay for what should be a very simple extension, and I'm not getting any answers. Um, Richard, I'd love to come in and meet you in person and just go over the process. You know, I've, I've got a very young family here. We're holed up in a three bedroom apartment and we're supposed to be building our forever home. Um, and it's just not going as planned. And I'm very, very frustrated as I'm sure other people are. Um, and I just, I just need some help. I really need some help from you guys to understand this process better and, and move, move this along because I just want to build, I want to build the house. That's what I want to do. That's it. Okay, Thank you. Um, I, I don't know if you want a response. I, I will respond to you in private email, uh, but I, Akash Shah has been updated on the status of your project and will be available at City Hall tomorrow morning um, at public counter hours from 8 to noon. Richard, do you have a comment on that? Chair, would you like me to respond? I'll, I'll go through the chair. <laughs> you are the meeting leader here. Um, I, I think I, it's fine if you got if you think you got an answer for the gentleman. Yes, sir. Certainly, I'm not able to look at our database right now. I'm having issue with that connection, uh, but my understanding was basically a workload issue. The, Jessica was trying to wrap this up before she left, and. There, there was just too much on her plate. Uh, so Akash does have it, and I know he is working on it, and I can have staff follow up with the property owner. Okay. Uh, Vice, Vice Chair Maza. Uh, could we uh, ex uh, extend it to uh, 531 and then continue it if there's a problem? Uh, Seems like adding a month if this is just a, a, a extension probably doesn't need to be. So if we if we could extend it to 531 and then the staff can say, nope, we didn't get it done, we'll extend it to 616. Is that possible, Richard? Uh, from a staff perspective, I believe we could get that. Um, we could probably wrap that up as my, I'm. Rebecca, it looks like, was able to get into our database, and apparently there is 
something we do need from the applicant. Uh, Pat, is it possible to to change? Uh, the recommended action was to continue to the nineteenth. I know they adopted the um, the agenda at the beginning of the meeting. Is it possible for the commission? Uh, to make a motion to just have us bring us back at the first meeting, provided that the applicant gets us the materials in time. Sure. Yeah. So the because we're still a part of the, the meeting, there can always be a motion for reconsideration. In this instance, as you said, rather than the and and I want to be sure we're clear on the dates here. The staff recommendation was June nineteenth, and now the 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 wish or potential wish of at least Vice Chair Mazza and maybe the council the commission, excuse me, is to change that to May thirty first, twenty twenty three. Or, or June, well, to, perhaps I misunderstood uh, Vice Chair Mazza, but I think he meant first meeting, meaning the 5th of June. I no, think I, I think he meant the 31st. First. He did mean the I, 31st. Yeah, I heard the 31st. Is it? Sorry, the guys. Is the, the next meeting is the 31st, correct? Yes, the special meeting. So I'd like to make a motion to uh, extend it to 531. I'll second that. Terrific, you guys. Okay, roll call. Vice Chair Mazza? Yes. Commissioner Jennings? Yes. Commissioner Hill? Yes. Commissioner Peak? Yep. Chair Smith? Absolutely. Motion carries. Okay, hopefully that helps you a little bit, Mr. Murray. Yeah, uh, I'd just like to say, Mr. Murray, uh, you need to get your whatever they need in, or, or we're just having to extend it again. So, and there's a notice period, so you, you better hustle. <laughs> well spoken actually um okay i think we go right into am i correct 5a right no we need three we need a motion on 3b2 uh, i i move yeah. we uh accept consent item 3b1 3b2 3b2 okay I would, second. I would like a clarification of two questions on 3b2 I'll second. I will second the motion, nonetheless. Okay. Um, for discussion, uh, Commissioner Hill. Yeah. Um, just to just to clarify, um, there seem to be some outstanding questions about whether design changes qualify as substantial conformance to the existing CDP. I don't know how that's being resolved. And just to clarify, they would be using the new wave up rush study only if it's deemed a new project. Is that correct? Otherwise, they can use what they were using. That would be for Richard. Let's or Tyler's here. Hi, Tyler. Tyler's here. Um, uh, Tyler, I, I'll let you speak to the status because I think that's the key is where these guys are in obtaining a permit. Yeah, I think the applicant can speak to you know whether or not the uh, coastal engineering study can uh, you know determine the way they go with this project. It was my understanding that in order. For for some of this to be feasible, they were kind of waiting for that information to be to be settled. Uh, but I believe the applicant uh, maybe provide better clarity on the but specifics. Maybe I should wrap in my second question. They could address it at one time. One time, which is that, as I understand it, coastal doesn't permit new seawall seawalls, um, it's managed retreat, et cetera, nor wing walls because of the associations with uh, side scour and that kind of thing. So. Um, are, but we're talking about new seawalls here or just repairing old ones or what's? So this is actually kind of an interesting one. This one we approved many, many moons ago, uh, 2014, uh, 2016, Tyler? Yeah, sounds about right. And then it was appealed and it kind of sat there for a number of years. And it's my understanding that the neighbor who appealed it ended up buying the project. And then that was the end of the appeal and never moved forward. Uh, there is a retaining wall at the very bottom. This particular property is a slope. Broad Beach at this point is uh, 80 feet higher than, than the ocean. Um, so there is a slope here. And there was a retaining wall at the toe of the slope that was, um, I hope I'm explaining this well, and please stop me and ask questions if I'm not. It, the, the retaining wall was not at the bottom, at, at the face of the slope exposed towards the ocean. It, to, for the, the purposes of the wastewater system, I believe it was, 
there was this retaining wall that was in the slope. However, while it was in the slope, it was within the theoretical run-up area. And a variance was processed because while this was a retaining wall, since it wasn't a theoretical way of uprush, it met the definition of a seawall. And so a variance was processed for it. And, and that's how it was approved and how it got here. Um, and now, many years later, you know, this project has not yet commenced, uh, hence the extension request, and it is still going through, and Tyler, correct me if I misspeak here, but from talking to Lauren, it sounds like we're still going through the plan check process, and this is material that's need, needed to final up, finalize the design of, of that retaining wall that is now, we call it a seawall because of the fact that as approved, it didn't daylight, but it was in the theoretical wave uprush. So who decides whether this is substantial conformance to the existing, or I guess the CVP doesn't even exist yet, but whether they need to apply for a new one. So the, the CDP is, is valid, it, it, okay. well, except for extension. <laughs> so what the planning department's looking for and what I've conveyed, conveyed to the applicant is that the footprint of this retaining wall needs to match the footprint of what was approved by this committee. Well, I say this commission, uh, not uh, not specifically you folks, but the, the planning commission, they need to match the footprint. I, has, I did have a conversation with Pat Donegan about that because since this was a variance, we, we didn't feel that it was appropriate that they be allowed to extend any of the wing walls or anything like that. If if the footprint of the wall changes because it was through the variance process, my recommendation uh, would be that they need to come back to this body for an amendment. So either it'll be substantial conformance and we won't see it again, or it'll come back to us as, as a new permit completely, right? Is that uh, an amendment, uh, an to, amendment, an amendment to the okay. previous approval. Yes. All right. Yeah. I'm not so worried about the height of the wall uh, because well, the the theory the, the wave uprush was calculated. It, it's uh, where I believe we would get into an issue is if it moved forward, backward, mm -hmm. or physically became larger. Because then definitely there could be some issues there. So it's back behind the house. It's not affecting sand flow yeah. in, in any immediate way. It's under the house. Uh, the house is one of the types that um, stair steps down the slope from broad beach to the ocean below that's uh, two stories two stories it, 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 it's stacked uh, but it, it's under the house it's under the ocean or the seaward half of the house okay still scratching my head a bit but that sounds like you're going in the right direction uh vice chair maza uh i'm a little bit confused so if you determine well they have a CDP, so if we extend it, they can start building tomorrow morning, uh, or they're not through the plan check process. Tyler, they have not yeah. yet obtained uh, final approvals, correct? No, yeah, they're still working their way through the process. So if they get rejected at some point for not matching what was what the CDP said was there, then it starts all over? If the extension isn't granted. So th this is an extension for the current CDP for another year uh, so that they can kind of complete the plan check process and, and get the permits. Um, and if they don't complete it within that year, if this gets approved, then we'll either be back for a second extension. Uh, if there's something that happens in the process where they can't build the house without, uh, you know, extending the seawall, as Richard mentioned, then then perhaps it'll be back in front of you as a CDP amendment. Um now, could they get another extension? It's been seven years, you say, since it was issued? So th this is the technically the first. Um, so it got approved by the planning, then appealed to city council, I believe, then appealed to the Coastal Commission, uh, at which time it was finally resolved uh, from the neighbor who bought the property. Uh, so the notice of final action wasn't, this is this is the first extension since, uh, the notice of final action about three ago. Okay, thank uh, you. Thank you. So my motion stands. Yeah. Good, thank you. Okay. 
So you're basically clear. You don't feel like we have to bring in Mr. McNeil to speak with us or anything. It sounds like they're on the right track. Okay. okay. Would you like me to call the roll? Please. Vice Chair Mazza? Yes. Commissioner Jennings? Yes. Commissioner Hill? Yes. Commissioner Peak? Yes. Chair Smith? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Continue public hearings. We don't have any. Straight on to our friends, fellow commissioners, the Public Safety Commission. So we have conditional use permit number 23-002, an application to allow a temporary tow yard on weekends and holidays from May 27th, 2023 to September 4th, 2023 at the Malibu Middle and High School campus. And to present this to you for you, Chair Smith is uh, first day as an assistant planner, Alice Ann Myers. That's great. And congratulations, Alice Ann, very much. Thank you, Chair Smith. Um, good evening, Chair Smith and members of the Planning Commission. The item before you tonight is conditional use permit number 23 002 for a summer impound yard at 30215. Morning View Drive. Next slide, please. Project site is located on the north side of Morning View Drive on the Malibu Middle and High School campus. The image to the right shows the site relative to Zuma Beach and the Pacific Ocean. Highlighted in yellow at the bottom of the images, the project scope is proposed solely in the lower parking lot of the campus. That parking lot is split among two parcels as demarcated by the fine white parcel map lines. Next slide, please. The site is a paved parking lot currently used for Malibu Middle and High School staff parking. The image to the left shows the portion of the lot to be used for the tow yard looking toward the west. And the image to the right shows ingress and egress to and from the lot from Morning View Drive. Next slide, please. This is an image of the lot facing north. Next slide, please. CUP 23-002 is an application to allow for a summer tow yard between Memorial Day weekend and Labor Day weekend of 2023. Parking citations increase in the city of Malibu during the summer months and cause hazards to public safety. Therefore, the Public Safety Department of the city of Malibu is applying to permit a temporary tow yard for the summer of 2023 at this site to enforce parking citations that cause such hazards. The summer tow yard includes the following temporary development and operations. The tow yard will operate from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. on weekends and holidays only. The yard has a capacity to hold up to 31 vehicles. Vehicles will not be held in the lot overnight but will be transferred to an out of city location by 7 p.m. each day. There will be temporary fencing with a privacy screen to divide the upper half of the lot used for the tow yard from the lower portion of the lot used for school staff parking. Gates on either end of the fencing are also proposed. These will be left open on weekdays so high school staff can use the whole lot while summer programs are in session. Only one gate will be left open during use to ensure ingress and egress for the lot during tow yard operations. A kiosk with a table and chair for the operator and A-frame signage placed on Morning View Drive are also proposed in the application. Drip pans will be placed under vehicles and litter and debris will be disposed of each day. Next slide, please. Here is a site plan showing the layout of the proposed temporary development. The operator station with the kiosk is in the northeastern portion of the lot. The fence and gates outlined in black run through the center. The green rectangle represents where impounded vehicles will be stored. Next slide, please. On May 13th, 2023, a member of the public wrote to the Planning Commission expressing support for the 2023 impound yard and urged the city to pursue a permanent city-owned tow yard to avoid having to rely on the school district. Next slide, please. Staff recommendation is to adopt Planning Commission Resolution number 23-29, recommending that the Planning Commission approve conditional use permit number 23-002 
for a temporary short-term tow yard in the lower parking lot of the Malibu Middle and High School campus to store impounded vehicles from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. on weekends and holidays from Memorial Day weekend through Labor Day weekend of 2023. The applicant is available for questions. This concludes staff's presentation. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, back to us. Um, disclosures, Vice Chair Mazza. Uh, yes, I had a series of questions I gave Alison uh, in an email, which she promptly replied to and um, explained some of the questions I will ask during this hearing. Um, nothing that, well, some of it was not in this staff report, but it's will be public record. Commissioner Hill. Uh, I too had some email with Alison, um, clarified a few things, didn't learn anything that's not in the staff report. Great, Commissioner Peek. I have nothing other than I attended school there for many, many years, so I'm quite <laughs> familiar with the area. Oh, yeah, I, I, I went to school there, too, junior high. Yeah, old timers here. All right, Commissioner Jennings. None. And myself, none. Okay. Um, we have Mr. Flores here. Anybody want to uh, start out on this? Anybody got any? I have a question, Mr. Flores. You're you're a city employee, correct? That's correct. Yes, but uh, okay. public safety department. Okay, so we've asked in the past several times for comments from the safety commission, um, and we've never been allowed to get comments from them. This is not a comment from the safety commission. Is that correct? Or how, how did this go the other way? So, so the actual goal of setting up a temporary impound yard is a public safety commission project that is in kind of an annual project that goes, but this was brought forth uh, from the public safety department, uh, just because this is a project that we're pushing forward in partnership with the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, uh, as well as the public safety commission. But yeah, it is, it is involved with the public safety commission since that is one of their uh, priorities um, for their courses of action. Okay, uh, is there a process when we have a question of the Public Safety Commission? Do we go through you or do we just not go through anybody? Your question is if you have any questions of any Public Safety Commission uh, actions, is that, is that correct? Well, cer at certain times, we they're more expert than we are. So we, yeah. we've asked staff to ask them and we've never gotten a reply. Well, and so, sorry, Vice Chair Mazza and Chair Smith, if I may. So, yeah, the the Public Safety Commission does not is not a subsidiary body to the Planning Commission. They are both subsidiary bodies to the City Council. They can delegate and ask and, and ask questions. And so, I guess my is your is your question to to Mr. Flores is the Planning Commission allowed to? I guess you know set forth a series of questions and then get kind of a formal official answer from the Public Safety Commission? No, it's really, uh, they're commenting to us, it appears to me, on their project, but we can't go the other way. And I'm just wondering why that is. Did the, did the City Council direct staff to come to us, I guess is the question. I or was that taken upon by the public safety department? It, I think the, if I understand you correctly, uh, Commissioner Ma, uh, Vice Chair Maza, uh, your question is, did the public safety commission come up with the idea of a tow yard on their own, or did the council direct the public safety commission to create a tow, uh, to come up with a tow yard? Is that correct? I'm just asking how this came to us from them, apparently. And we can't go back and ask them. I guess we we have asked staff many times to ask city council or somebody to get us an answer, and we had zero. Certainly. So I'm just wondering how it goes back the other way. If we want to 
ask them some. Certainly. So the reason they're before this body tonight is uh, the Public Safety Commission effect. Uh, the Public Safety, uh, Louis. I'm sorry. I'm your division. <laughs> Susan, yes. <laughs> uh, Public Safety Division or Department. Department. Yeah. Department. Yeah. So the Public Safety Department yeah. is the applicant uh, for this conditional use permit and. What Luis is doing is uh, the comments were given to his department, jump in, Luis, if I'm wrong, uh, by the commission. Luis put together an applicant and the planning department uh, reviewed that application as a reviewing body and then brought it, since it's a conditional use permit, they can't, they can't approve that. The only body other than the city council uh, in, in the city would be the, the planning commission. And so they're here before you as an applicant, much like, um, oh, geez, the, the you know, uh, I see Norm's name on the screen. I'll use Norm, he'll be my victim. Much yeah. like Norm is a, as an applicant in front of this body. And then as Pat mentioned, if the commission would like to see the public safety commission be a uh, reviewing tool, uh, perhaps, uh, that is something we would need the city council to put in their work plan. Is that correct, Pat? Or in their, uh, the, 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 the commission, um, some commissions have yeah. charters. Right, yeah, what, yeah. I, I don't believe the public safety commission has a charter, but so yes, that, that, that is accurate. That decision to, I guess, get the feedback or official kind of action by the public safety commission is not one the planning commission can order. But staff could... In this case, staff had the Public Safety Commission make a recommendation, and then they brought it to us. Can we do the same thing? In so, terms of, oh, go ahead, Richard. Sorry, I was going to say the Public Safety Commission provided comment to the Public Safety Department, um, and and that department, not the Planning Department, was the applicant. Like I said, we we. I'm I make it a point to keep our department here. Uh, just to, I try to keep us as reviewing bodies. Okay, well, I'm totally confused. I just think that at some point we should be able to find out information from other departments, but I'm confused on that. Um, I have a couple other questions. Unless Skyler wants to go first, do you have a question on this, Skyler? I was just going to say, go ahead, Commissioner Peake. Okay, so it sounds like it's really like a sort of procedural thing for them to have to come here to apply for this. I guess that's what I was saying to kind of cut to the chase of that. I don't think that there's anything wrong. If we have a question about something they're coming us, we can contact any one of the public safety commissioners on our own accord. Is that correct, Patrick? There's nothing to stop us from doing that, right? Yeah, the 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 application and applicant are are are, are before you tonight. If, if no, no, if, I, no I, I understand if, that. Yeah, yeah, no, if, no, if, if we have a question of a public safety correct. commissioner, if it correct, if it, we if, want if, something to go to them, we can call any one of our public safety commissioners and say, hey, you know, make it a point to talk about this, and it's up to them to then get the consensus of their as you know fellow sure. um, commissioners at a public meeting, yeah. and. They Very similar, yeah. Or we go to the city council and we say, hey, we want this feedback from the Public Safety Commission. And the council says yes or no. Yeah, yeah. Very similar to the way that you all can call project applicants, neighbors, and solicit feedback um, as, as you, in your role as the city's planning commission, a.k.a. city decision makers. So okay. let me get this right. If we want something from the city council or a commission, we cannot go there as planning as a planning commission but we can go there individual as a uh, individual and so so to, to be clear that as an individual and, and so maybe we're getting confused here about if you want to speak to an individual public safety commissioner totally fine you cannot go as a planning commissioner to a public safety commission meeting say and say I direct or command you all to review x y and z and then i'm going to sit here and you guys are going to tell me and you're going to deliberate as a body i believe what what commissioner peak was saying and commissioner peak interrupt me i i, I don't want to put words in your mouth during your pre preparation for tonight's meeting you of course could have reached out to any number of, of individuals including a public safety commissioner and said hey this is on our agenda tonight thoughts 
That that's yes, that's what I was saying, and that's com you're completely allowed to do that. But we can. Does that mean we can? I could walk into a public safety commission meeting and say, "Please tell us what you think about blah blah." Yeah, but you have to understand that you would be doing that as an individual. As an individual, I can walk in there and say, "Gee, I think this is unsafe." Can you tell the planning commission if it is or isn't? It was on their agenda that night. No, I'm yes. just saying public comment. Yeah, you could you could you can make a public comment on anything. You're a resident of the community. There's nothing to stop you from doing that, or anybody else that lives in Malibu for that matter. But you can't go there and say. I'm representing the planning commission and we all think you should do this. And this is what we want you to do that you cannot do. Okay. And is the Brown act involved? The Brown act is always involved for all city bodies. I'm not sure how any of the discussions that we've just had you making a public comment at one of their meetings is in no way a, you know, potential violation of the Brown act. If you ask them, please comment on X, Y, and Z. Okay. Uh, another question on this is this property, the application, as I understand it, is the uh, city of Melbourne, not the school district. But in the findings, the school district is liable for everything we do and uh, pays for all uh, all expenses. And I don't see anything in our staff report that says they even applied or is given permission. So how does how does one body ask for a, a CDP or CUP on somebody else's property and make them liable for all the expenses? So, so I can comment on that. So this, uh, the CUP was coordinated in uh, partnership with the Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District. So there was an agreement in place between uh, the city's public safety department, this, the school district for the use of the uh, high school lot uh, for this project. Uh, and I also met with the principal of the high school and actually developed the site plan that you saw on the staff for uh, staff report, you know, with, with all these considerations. So we took into account uh, you know, summer school, potential use of the upper parking lot. So a lot of these different considerations went into the development of the site plan. Uh, and we've been kind of back and forth in partnership with school district representatives for the last couple of months, kind of preparing uh, the CUP application. So this was, and the, in terms of kind of the expenses, you know, the, the city's been, uh, you know, will pay for the temporary fencing installation, as well as, you know, in the agreement that we have with the school district should you know, one of the, uh, you know, vehicles that's impounded drive off and, you know, damage, you know, any part of the property, the city would be responsible for it. So, so the city actually took the liability for it, uh, just because we are utilizing the space for the school, uh, the school district's property. So my question is, how would yeah. we know that? We don't see any agreement. They're not mentioned at all in the staff report. Um, and if a liability, pro one of these guys drives over a little kid, the way the staff report reads, school district's problem. So that's why I'm a little reluctant to, I want the tow yard. I'm a little reluctant to stick the school district with all the liabilities. We're making findings and making findings of fact that the applicant is liable and we don't see any agreement that says somebody else is. And we don't see any record that the school district has approved this or even applied. And my question is, can somebody apply for a CUP on somebody else's land without getting their permission? No. Um, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it, this is just all theoretical, but what we're approving tonight says they're liable. It doesn't mention any other side agreements. It just says they're liable. And if I were the school district and, and a planning commissioner, I'm a little nervous saying the school's liable. And that's why I wonder why aren't they co co applicants or uh, the agreement is part of the findings or something that takes these paragraphs out of the findings and the, uh, and the resolution that says I, they're liable. 
Vice Chair Miles, I'm going to let I'm going to let Associate Planner Myers answer first, and then our director if need to. Fine. Hi, Vice Chair Mazza. Um, I was just wondering what number finding or condition you're referring to, so we can look at the. Okay. More specifically. I think second. it might have been finding nine. Finding nine, yes. Property owner pays. So, the finding nine. I see is the proposed project will comply with all applicable. Requirements of state and local oh, law. I guess the wrong. I, was, yeah. I believe. I believe that he, he's referencing condition of approval number nine, which reads: the property owner must submit payment for all its any fees payable to the city prior to the issuance of any building permit, including grading or demolition or the placement of temporary structures. Is that is that what you're referencing? Yeah, that's right. Nine. That nine. Okay, so that's um, kind of a standard, a standard condition, standard language uh, we use, but in this case. There, there will be no building permits um, issued for the development. And because the applicant is the city, we're not uh, charging planning fees. In, we do not charge the applicant planning fees. Okay, and there's another one in here. Um, Director Malika, can you maybe help this along a little bit, please? Certainly. So it has not been our standard practice to include copies of the agreement. Um, you know, a lot of times uh, restaurants are what you guys typically see uh, for conditional use permits, and many times it is the operator of the restaurant obtaining the conditional use permit. Even though ultimately the landowner is always responsible, uh, there, there's they are they are indemnified legally uh, through the some sort of operating agreement, and in this case there is one. Uh, as I mentioned, we typically don't put them in the reports. Uh, there is a representative from the district here, uh, Mr. Upton is here, and then uh, I I just wanted to say I'm trying to beat Pat to it, but it looks like we have some public speakers, so we should probably open up to public comment before we get too far. Oh, Chair, yeah. Chair, if I could clarify, Section Five, Number One, the property owners shall indemnify the city. That standard standard clause, but it's just weird here because it's not the owners applying. Okay, well we we can get into that. I think. Um... We can, there he is, Mr. We can uh, unmic uh, Mr. Upton, please. Mr. Upton. Oh, yes, this is Terry Upton. Uh, Terry Upton, Chief Operations Officer. Um, as a school district, which is a state entity, we follow the Civic Center Act. And by that, it does give us the right and authority to permit the use of our facilities uh, and to issue uh, uh, permits for those facilities. As the city is an applicant to the district to use the facility, we are issuing a facility use permit that very clearly states the liability issues. And that, uh, that permit is in force with this permit, which is your conditional use permit of how this property is used. So we have that in place. And uh, uh, so we are making sure to protect the school district for, from this use. Great, thank you. Um, well, you know, somebody's got a better place for this yard. I think this is a uh, last year we went through. Hang three. on, hang on, hang on. We should. Let's get, oh, get the public questions. comment. Very sorry. Comment. Very sorry. <laughs> questions first, and then public comment, and then the deliberation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and as applicant, Louise, did you have any initial comments you'd like to make before we hear from our other public speakers? Uh, no, nothing at the moment. Just want to again reecho you know, Mr. Upton's comments that you know we pretty much entered this agreement, you know, knowing very well that we were going to be doing this in partnership with the school district. And again, we really. I've uh, been meeting with the principal, with the school district staff, and making sure that, uh, you know, we're, we're taking into account all the different factors such as safety, 
you know, our partnership with the LA County Sheriff's Department, the use of the occasional use of these school districts a lot in the upper side of the high school, making sure that ingress and egress is, you know, kept clear and that all safety precautions are uh, taken into consideration throughout the operation of the temporary impound yard. So just wanted to conclude with that. Thank you, Luis. Our first speaker will be Ryan Embry, followed by Chris Frost and then Josh Spiegel. Thank you. I want to say that I'm very much in favor of resuming this tow operation to this location. Um, it, it does um, raise a lot of issues that actually John Mazza brought up as it relates to whose fingerprints are all over this application and does the liability follow? Because um, when we did this the last time, the tow operator was was a different uh, company and that company didn't even speak before the commission, the public safety commission or before the city council. And they are the operator and they should be the applicant. They're the ones making a lot of money off of every tow. Now the city makes a fee off of it as well, but they're making a lot of money off of every tow. I mean, it could be over $150 to the tow truck company. They turn around, and they go get another car. I'm I'm not speaking to the operation, which is very well described in the staff report. However, the applicant that's impounding here um, is, is really that the tow company needs to secure property where they can do this operation. And we have a consenting commission and a consenting city staff and a consenting tow truck operator and Los Angeles County Sheriff is consenting, but the applicant is not the city. And how we got here really does matter. We missed the point and the last tow truck operator said, well, they'd, they'd like it, but they really don't wanna pay for any of the city's permits and would like a permit fee waiver and didn't want to fill out the application and and uh, and and so forth with the city and the commission the council went through the whole thing and heard it up at the last minute and yeah there really wasn't a formal completed application but we have this shadow entity standing in line on behalf of the true operator and and that's the city and it's it is quite troubling here that the city is essentially factoring a fee waiver by the fiat of the staff becoming involved in being the applicant. Um, that's unusual. The tow truck driver will be making plenty of money and should pay the fee. I don't know if, if that's the business of the planning commission to say, but um, it, it this also might relate to some of the timing that the applicant was unwilling or uncooperative or that the, the Public Safety Commission speaks to the City Council through resolution, and they don't really speak to this commission, although the, the Council did assign them the task of evaluating sites, you know, in the last year. So the Council is already aware that Malibu High School is the optimum location. So the... Thank you, Ryan. You are at time. And our next speaker will be Chris Frost, followed by Josh Spiegel. If there are other members of the public who would like to speak on this item, please click your raise hand button as we listen to Chris Frost. Good evening, commissioners. Um, first off, uh, relating to what Skyler said, I was in the very first graduating class from Malibu Park as a junior high school in 1966, and I graduated with Skyler's dad, Dusty, so I'd point that out. Um, I agree with the resident who said that we need a permanent solution to this problem. Uh, this is going on three years now, third or fourth year that the Public Safety Commission has been tasked with finding a place for it and trying to get this thing together. And because things take so long, sometimes it ends up sounding like it's at the last minute when in reality it started at the end of the previous summer. So we cannot go through summer without a tow operation. Um, I've been involved in what, three or four operators now, and every year the number of visitors to our city has just increased. And along with that comes clogged streets, parking restricted areas, blocked fire hydrants, blocked driveways, interference in line of sight, and a host of other safety issues that this creates. 
we have, we, you know, we, and we actually have these problems throughout the whole year, but summer ramps up the problems just exponentially. So, you know, I want to see this get taken care of. Uh, and I hope that maybe we start a little earlier and possibly find something of a permanent solution for this. And to quote Brian Merrick, who happened to be, happened along one day out on the point when the whole street was jammed with people parked illegally. And he said, Chris, they are coming and we can't stop them. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Our next speaker is Josh Spiegel. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your time. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioners. Um, thank you, staff, um, both the planning staff and um, the Public Safety Department staff for putting this together. That's that's really nice. I'm not sure if I'm speaking as an individual here, but <laughs> um, we'll get we'll get over it. I think uh, Richard Malika also went to Malibu High, so I don't want to leave him out. Um, Anyway, I, I can't really add much after after Chris Frost. I mean, clearly the best site is Malibu High School. This is where it's been for years and years. The last couple of years, um, we've had to use Baylord. We had to use Heathercliff. Those aren't optimal um, sites. We looked at about 20 other sites throughout Malibu. I mean, it's this is the logical place. And I'd like to uh, sincerely thank uh, Mr. Upton for his cooperation. And in allowing us um, to use the school's facilities. So um, Chris is here, I'm here. If you have any questions, we'll hang around and wait for the vote, but we sure would love to see you approve this conditional use permit tonight. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Josh. And that concludes our public speakers this evening. Okay, terrific. Um, we got all kinds of hands up. Commissioner Hills had his up the longest. I'm going to go to him first. Yay. Thank you for recognizing that. Um, yeah, I, it, this makes a lot of sense as a temporary thing. Um, and our job here is to dot I's and cross T's. So I have some questions about just some of the underlying stuff. Um, with respect to potential impacts and the bureaucracy associated with that, this whole site has an EIR, right? And this project has been called CEQA exempt, but this is a question for probably Richard or Patrick. Uh, if the site has an EIR already and we're, we're changing the use on it, why or why not would we have to use a supplemental to the EIR to talk about things like, you know, is there gonna be any noise or traffic or runoff or potential cumulative effects that, you know, this, this thing will, probably do very little, but who knows what other thresholds were right near. Why Why don't we need to modify or amend or supplement the existing EIR? <laughs> you guys are trying to- hey, Did you want to take that one or, or did you want me to? I mean, I, I, I will say that of course, as the city decision makers, if you are not, you know, satisfied with the environmental review and, and, and the environmental documentation that is of course kind of within your your purview to either sign off on that or if you have issues with it not um as to as to kind of the the substance of any of the potential i guess uh, I, I, maybe alleged impacts i will I'll, i will have to defer that to, to staff in terms of i believe the ones you said were noise and, and aesthetics is i think it's mainly a question of legal process right <laughs> And then that's and Pat, I appreciate you jumping in because that that's what I was going to actually ask you about the legal processing aspects. Because when we looked at this, because this was a temporary summer only item, not development related, uh, it was independent from the work that the school district's doing. I forget how many phases there are, but this was not functionally related to that development. But as you mentioned in the beginning, that of course. Uh, if, if this decision body feels differently, uh, that is within their purview. Okay. Um, I asked Alison about uh, potential interactions with what's going on on campus. I know it's classes, summer school on weekdays, and this is on the weekends, but I just wondered, are there any other activities going on on, on, on the weekends, sports activities or anything, anything else on campus that 
Are we, are we going to have kids on bikes or skateboards coming by here while tow trucks are coming in? Is that anything on the radar? Maybe that might be for Luis. Yeah, that, that was taken into consideration. That is something we actually discussed with uh, Principal Miller at the high school. Just, you know, again, taking into consideration all the different activities that the high school and middle school host. Um, so really the point that of why we will be installing the temporary uh, the uh, temporary fencing a little bit before the actual entrance to the upper parking lot is for that reason, just because there may be the occasional uh, event permit or, you know, event going on in the upper section where the sports usually take place. So the goal is not to have any uh, any vehicles or any fencing uh, block the ingress and egress of that upper parking lot area. And, you know, we're, we're going to be doing this in partnership with the LA County Sheriff's Department. That is something uh, that they did last year as well, just kind of routine you know, driving around the area, making sure that we're kept free of any public safety hazards. Uh, and the site will always have a, a, a tow yard staff and personnel on site to make sure that, you know, all protocols are being followed and make sure that the vehicles uh, that are on the on the lot, you know, have the oil pans underneath and, you know, making sure that there are no kind of, uh, I guess, public safety hazard really with, you know, running over any individuals on the bike or a skateboard. Obviously, that's something we we're going to be wanting uh, to monitor uh, throughout the summer, making sure that, you know, all the vehicles that are coming in and out are, you know, taking that into account. And also we're not blocking any entrance or exit to that upper parking lot area, which is really why we did this in partnership with the uh, school principal. Okay. And then my last, my last con concern and thought is that this is, this is probably fine temporarily, but um, well, th there's, I've observed a lot of, of argument and, and inconsistencies about data when, wh over, the, over the last year when it was at Heathercliff and were we getting the number of cars correct from the sheriff or the city or the towing company and who was, what cars were towed from where, by whom, to what place and all that. It just seems kind of like a big melee. And now we have these numbers that say, uh, there was, well, um, the staff report says the highest amount of violations are concentrated about around Point Doom and Zuma. And then the numbers on the map show that 68 of the 361 are in Eastern Malibu. And so just to kind of look at the math a little bit, if, if say just in round numbers, if 300 cars are around Zuma and Point Doom, they might be towed an average of two miles each, say, to get to this lot. Whereas, if 60 cars are on the east end, they might be towed an average of 15 miles each. When you figure in the round trips uh, and add up the math, you're talking about 600 truck miles around Zuma and Point Doom and 900 truck miles around the eastern end. So all that pointing to the center of gravity of the need is probably somewhere closer to, for example, the lot at the base of Latigo, which is not zoned, for this, but uh, that would be kind of the, the the best closest place. So I'm wondering, just for future reference, if if we're looking into, you know, that could have a zoning amendment, or if there are other sites kind of in a little bit more east. Um, I think that would help in the long run. And I, I guess that's not a question, but uh, an observation. Okay, uh, Commissioner Peak. All right. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I just want to, first off, thank you, uh, staff, and thank you, uh, Carrie and the other public safety commissioners for being here. It seems like this is something where we completely have the school district on board with the city to come up with a solution to a problem. So I don't think that we need to make that any more difficult than it needs to be. And it seems also that it is the most practical location. We've heard that from many people. And it was probably, I'm going to say 10 years ago, I might have the exact amount of time wrong, but there was a time when on PCH, you were only allowed to park with two tires on the pavement and two tires on the dirt. And those guys, the tow company at the time was removing cars from that area like hotcakes and they would fill it up very quickly. And that's because they had the proximity of the tow yard to where they were having the multiple violations. And also... It doesn't make sense for them to be driving up, unfortunately, to the Heathercliff lot in the summer when the light at Canaan is jammed and the traffic is all the way down to Zuma. It's going to take a tow truck driver 
all of a half an hour to make it from that area up to the Heather Cliff yard and back down. So I think that this is a good solution. I appreciate staff for working on it and I'd like to make a motion to support it. If I have a second. I'll and second it. Second it with an amendment. Hang on, vice chair, hang on. Uh, Commissioner Jennings. Oh, he I got said it. I would second it. Okay, but you had your hand up if you want to comment. Do you still want to comment? Yes, friendly amendment. I would no, like please. to. Vice chair, <laughs> asking. Who are you asking? Jennings, he had his hand up. <laughs> To comment, I had, please. I had my hand up because I was going to move the staff recommendation. Okay. Skyler moved it. I've seconded it. That's the only comment I have. <clears throat> okay, and I have a friendly amendment. Okay, I agree with everything everybody said, but I think the conditions of approval, the resolution, section five, number one, should read. The city of Malibu and their successors in interest shall indemnify the Santa Monica School District, blah, blah, blah. It's backwards now. And you can say, oh, gee, the school district isn't going to sue the city. city isn't going to sue the school district. But if something happens there, it's going to be an individual who sues. Okay? They're both going to be named parties, and there's going to be massive expenses. And the school district has nothing to do with this, okay? As they admitted, and and uh, uh, Mr. Flores said, we got an agreement. So we shouldn't put in a resolution saying the city is liable, uh, that the Santa Monica School District is liable for all expenses and indemnifies the city for all expenses. It's not correct, okay? And then I think we can correct two other places where it's backwards, and that is, John, John, how about how about I, I think that everybody's on the same page here in terms of how the liability should read. I don't I'm not disagreeing with you. I have full faith in our staff that they're going to work out the agreement with the proper, correct language. Well, I, I just want to say that if I had a little kid who's walking down the street and the tow truck guy squashes him, I'm going to go by this resolution. I'm going to sue the tow truck company. And no. You're, yeah, you're, you're going to go after the city because we allowed them to put a tow yard there. I get it. No, 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 no. This says the school district yeah. is liable for anything the city loses. I, I, I understand that. And I'm saying that I think our staff can figure that out. And the school district isn't going to let that fly. And they're going to work that out. Yeah, but, but we're need, passing this. It's in the resolution. It says, it says the exact opposite. It says the exact opposite. Yeah, but, 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 Chair, if I may. Please. And so, and so, th this is a, a a standard condition of approval that is typical on on basically any and all CUP. I understand the practical concern that that Vice Chair Maz and Regular is saying is saying, "Hey, this doesn't seem to make sense to us." But th th for the same way that I'll, I'll go back to Director Malika's example with the restaurant, we we have the exact same thing. Now, I can't speak for all all owners, but I can assure you, most would say, "Hey, you Pat Donigan, if you're if you are operating a restaurant on, on my property." You're required to have the insurance, and I'm going to enter into an agreement where you indemnify me, irrespective of the of these conditions of approval that that are articulated in the CUP. Okay. My understanding is that is exactly what we have here: that the school district and the city are going to flesh that out, the exact insurance requ requirements, the in exact in indemnity requirements, and the only thing that I, I would potentially push back on is that those agreements are. While somewhat standard, they typically do have a, a, a little bit of back and forth. So we don't want to prejudice ourselves by in this saying, city, you're on the hook for everything, even though that may be the case down the road. But there may be issues like, like you know, the school district's uh, negligence or willful misconduct that we may be able to, you know, negotiate for ourselves. And so it would be my advice to leave the, con the, the standard template conditions as is, and as Commissioner Peake said, Leave it. This is a unique situation because in this instance, the applicant is the city and 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 and, and let us handle that 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 that, that okay. I, I also want to make a friendly amendment. I also want to say back to you that the plaintiff council doesn't have to agree with what you said. It's written here and we're voted for it. No. Okay. That makes it law. Now the other one is is number 10 says the property owner shall comply with the MMC and the LIP. The property owner has nothing to do with it as far as operating the system, which means that 
Nobody has to comply with MMC and the LIP. All you have to do is change the word property owner to the city of Malibu. That's all you have to do. But let's leave it the way it was when it's, when, when it's somebody else instead of the city. I mean, it makes no sense legally to say that right. nobody has to comply with the LIP. So we have we have a motion and we have a second. And I believe we understand where you're coming from, Vice Chair. So I think we need to let's take a roll call on this. Uh, Vice Chair or Commissioner Hill. I mean, I just say to Patrick's point, maybe you just change the, the condition to say the district and the, the city will negotiate the liability issues separately. And take those two provisions out. I mean, whatever. But if I'm if I'm an attorney and I'm suing the city for fifty million dollars for squashing my kid, I'm gonna go by what officially was voted on and reported by the staff. That's so what John, I'm you're, on. you're not. Well, if if I were uh, trying to get money, I, I would. Okay. Uh, chair? chair. We've got it. We've got it, gentlemen. Uh let's take a roll chair. call, Rebecca. Chair. Uh, Prior to roll call, I, could I just confirm with the maker and seconder whether they accept the friendly amendment? I don't think there's a reason for the amendment. Jeff? No. Thank you. Commissioner Peak? Yes. Commissioner Jennings? Yes. Commissioner Hill? Abstain. Vice Chair Mazza? Um, I am very much in favor of this project. I'm going to abstain because the liability of the uh, city is not proportional to the risk they're passing. Chair Smith? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. We have uh, down here. We've got 5B. Posted development permit, uh, Woolsey Fire number 22-007, site plan review number 22-016, an application for an addition to a previously approved fire rebuilt single family residence and associated development. And we have a staff report. Yes, hi, uh, Chair Smith, uh, members of the Planning Commission, I'm here to present for Akash uh, for this Woolsey Fire project um, agent. Next slide, please. So uh, this property is located in the Malibu Park neighborhood, uh, north of Harvester Road. Um, the original single family home was destroyed in the 2018 Woolsey fire. And the size of the parcel is about a half acre in size and is in the rural residential zoning district. Next slide. So uh, just a quick timeline of events. The um, the rebuild originally under planning verification 2103 was approved with an in-kind rebuild plus 10%. Um, that pre-fire square footage uh, of the residence and garage was uh, about 2,200 square feet. Um, the square footage approved under the PVWF with the additional 10% brought it up to about 2,315 square feet. Uh, a de minimis waiver was also approved uh, June of 2021 for the replacement on-site wastewater treatment system, and that ODS can accommodate the uh, proposed additions under this application. Next slide, please. So this project uh, proposed uh, an additional 2,113 square feet of additions to the single family residence. There is a new uh, 923 square feet basement uh, below the residence uh, attached to the subterranean garage. Uh, this will bring the total development square footage or TDSF up to 4,428 square feet for the lot. There's a new swimming pool and spa uh, proposed, an 830 square foot uh, pool deck that's on grade, a uh, little over 1,000 square feet in rooftop decking. There is after the fact approval of hedges uh, proposed, um, a total impermeable coverage of 5,813 square feet and 72 uh, cubic yards of non-exempt grading. There's also one discretionary request uh, proposed that is for a site plan review for height over 18 feet up to 24 feet for a flat roof. Next slide. 
So as I, I mentioned previously, uh, the project proposes um, a new pool and some additional site work. Um, also some additions to the single family home, which all uh, meet the required setbacks. And all of the proposed development is on slopes that are flatter than three to one. Next slide. So this, um, I'm sorry, the original PVWF application approved a 503 square foot subterranean garage. Uh, this application looks to add a 923 square foot basement attached to that uh, subterranean garage. The total new basement area is uh, 1,426 square feet, 213 of which is being counted towards the site's TDSF. Next slide. This here is our first floor plan. Uh, a 799 square foot uh, patio area is being enclosed and a 150 foot square, uh, sorry, 150 square foot study room is being proposed to the southeastern side of the house. The total first floor area will now be 3,231 square feet. Next slide. A new 984 square foot second floor is proposed and a 290 square foot vaulted ceiling area is also proposed. Next slide. Um, the roughly 1,500 square foot second floor area will be compliant with the two thirds rule. Next slide. As mentioned before, the project proposes um, height up to 24 feet and is requesting a site plan review. Next slide. Uh, one more elevation here shows the entrance to the turning garage and none of the second floor uh, deck railing will exceed 18 feet in height. Next slide. Uh, photos were taken to demonstrate the story pools uh, that were uh, installed for this application for the second story. And also uh, you see there some framing that had started under the PVWF application. Um, no primary view determinations in the immediate area are anticipated to be impacted. And additionally, we received some correspondence from the immediate neighbor to the north uh, that they were with the proposed second story addition. Next slide. Another perspective here demonstrates that the Houses uh, to the north of the property are are elevated and and help ease some of the potential impacts. Next slide. Um, during the site visit um, for the story of poles, it was discovered that some hedges were installed without permits on the property. Uh, the applicant later submitted a hedge plan to the city for approval, and and they were reviewed and approved by our colleagues. Next slide. Um, we received some concern uh, after the staff report was published about the um, proposed fuel modification plan and I guess the absence of a full landscape plan. And so uh, to kind of make sure we cure everything um, for this site, we uh, we recommend one additional condition. Uh, that condition is, is here and then read as follows. The applicant and or owner must submit a landscape plan to the planning director for review and approval prior to the planning department's final approval on this project. Next slide. So with that, uh, staff recommends approval of the project as amended and we're available for any questions. Great, thank you. Um, okay, back to us, uh, disclosures. Vice Chair Mazza. I visited the site with uh, Craig uh, a couple of days ago. Did not walk the site, look through the fence since the site was locked. Okay, um, Commissioner Peak. I did not visit the site recently, but having been there um, a lot doing a house across the street a while ago, um, and I do want to disclose that I know the personally know the neighbor that Craig had conversation with about, I believe it's the neighbor to the north. I'm imagining the pro property behind west or west. Sorry, west would be correct. Um, he didn't, he never spoke with me about it at all. So I just wanted to put that out there. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Jennings. I'm familiar with the site, but I had, I didn't have any contact with uh, the applicant or anybody else on the project. 
Commissioner Hill? Yeah, as John said, I visited the site with him. Um, wasn't clear. It looked like the possibly the basement was already going. Um, hard to tell. Um, I, have, I do have a couple other questions. And, and also, by way of disclosure, uh, had some email with the neighbor that Skyler mentioned, because uh, I know he, a couple of years ago, had a big primary view issue. And so I just wanted to give him a nudge and see if he was awake, because I thought he might care about this. And uh, he said, yeah, we're good. We talked to these guys and uh, looked at the plans, and they've been very communicative, and that's good. And I, and I sent him back an email and said, great, glad to hear it. And, uh, you know, one potential concern is the noise of the rooftop deck. And that that's all I said. I, to be clear, I was not advocating anything one way or the other, just raising concerns that I've heard from uh, the public and based on past experience. Okay, um, I did speak with the owner uh, today and uh, didn't really learn anything different except for he's done his homework and gotten with his neighbors and and uh, they've been through some tough stuff and they're they're back to do this. So I spoke with Mr. Byford about it and that's that's pretty much what I know. Um, okay. Who wants to uh, you want public uh, public hearing? Big public hearing. Thank you. Um, if other members of the public are present in the meeting and would like to speak on this item, please click your hand or click the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen as James Pfeiffer, the owner, um, provides a couple of comments. And James, um, uh, yeah, I think, I, I think I'm here. Hi. Firstly, can I thank you all for uh, obviously allowing this to, to come in front of you guys. I know you're really busy. Um, I, I've obviously seen a couple of the concerns. Obviously, I'm very close to the neighbors. I've stayed very close with all of the neighbors. We've all been through quite a lot. Um, so I've obviously seen emails back and forth. Uh, I made a very, very you know, big point of sitting down with everybody in the community to make sure everyone was aware of what I, I would like to do. Uh, I'm, I, as I'm sure you've seen my letter to you guys earlier, um, you know, I've kind of briefly explained the situation, how we got to this point. Um, if, if, if the roof deck, you know, is, is a real concern, it, it isn't my intention to build a huge roof deck. It never was. Uh, if it looks bigger on the plans than it should be, my apologies. The objective is really just to have a little roof deck to go and watch the sunsets from. Not, not a party deck, as obviously has been alluded by, by various emails back and forth for some strange reason. People seem to think that I'm going to throw some wild parties on a massive roof deck as soon as I build a house, which is not my intention at all. Um, and I just want you guys to know that if it's the roof deck that's a problem, we'll reduce it in size. It really isn't a big deal. Um, you know, you'd have to get through three lockable gates to get anywhere near the roof deck. I know that was a concern. Uh, I've seen I've seen people mention that you don't even have to access the house to get up on the roof, but you'd have to break into the property in order to do so. And at that point it's trespassing. And let's face it, we're all at risk from that, whether we've got a roof deck or not. So I don't really see that as a valid, a valid argument, but you know, over to you guys. But, and again, thank you very much for, for taking the time to review it. I do appreciate it. Thank you, James. And I don't see other, sorry, I'm getting a weird feedback. feedback. Uh, I don't see any other members of the public present in the meeting. Rebecca, you have two audio sources going in the room together. You sound like Lou Gehrig. I do. I'm not. I think um, another planner briefly unmuted and it's overlapped us. Okay. Uh, back to us. Vice Chair Mazza. Okay. Um, I've got several process questions. The house appears to be compliant, but. Um, First, the LIP requires us to receive a complete uh, CDP, including a landscape plan. So, and that's a requirement. So I'd like Patrick to opine on whether we can just delegate that without seeing it. So Vice Chair Mazza, as as an initial matter, if that is an issue for the planning commission, you can undoubtedly continue this item or, you know, basically say we're, we're, we're not going to vote yes on it until we see it. It is my understanding that while not always the case, it has been done before that a landscape plan 
basically that, that the planning commission has, you know, approved a project without seeing the landscape plan in front of it under very similar circumstances, i.e., you know, hey, the applicant, you must submit one, you know, to the satisfaction of, of the of the planning director. However, that is not mandated, no required. It is up to your guys' discretion. Well, here, my question is, if the LIP says it is mandated, can the city ignore that? So I will I will stand by my answer that if, if, if the planning commission is uncomfortable without it, you're more than welcome to, to continue it. That is entirely up to your discretion. I will say in the past, it has been done via this planning commission that a project has been approved with a similar condition directing the applicant to submit a landscape plan to the satisfaction of the director. Okay, now my real process question is, we are on, on page four of 15, we are told what the project description is. And the second item number B says, a new 923 square foot basement below the residence. My question of staff is, has, and staff says this, this is an addition to a completed building. When you, when you go out and look at it, it appears no see, no uh, certificate of occupancy, occupancy or any completion notice has been given, and the applicant has built a basement without any permits um, because they're asking for a permit under this CDP. Also, when I look at the property, the framing of the building is not been approved because no CDP was issued for a second floor. And it's, and it's got, obviously, even the, the uh, Part of the story poles are steel beams for the second floor. Um, so my question is, how do you step ahead of permits that we have to give? Who in the planning department or the permit department is allowing construction of a building that hasn't been approved? And why? And why are we being asked to approve it now when somebody in staff has already said, go ahead and do it, or not, not inspect it. Senior Pioneer Eaton, you want to? Yeah, so uh, it looks like building permits have been issued for uh, the PVWF, as I mentioned. And so uh, part of that PVWF was a subterranean garage. Uh, it is also to my understanding that um, the area that they are now converting into a basement with living area um, was was under structure and it was part of the foundation. Uh, and, and so part of this application is to just uh, remove, you know, the dirt in that understructure area to create uh, the habitable basement. Well, my question is, it's already removed. And my other question is, we are approving a 923 square foot basement tonight if this passes. And you're now telling us it's already been approved. And you're you're and my question is, you're now telling us the second story has already been approved. But but that's what they're asking for. So was it approved and who approved it? This is the CDP. Yeah, so again, the basement has not yet been approved. Uh, right now, it's supposed to be under structure area. Uh, again, the sunny garage has been approved under the planning verification, so that might be what you're referring to. Uh, as you saw in the story polls, I hope that demonstrated, the second story ha has not been built yet. Uh, the, the story polls on top of the framing for the first floor uh, to, to help demonstrate the proposed height for this application. That's absolutely not the case. When you go out and look at it, when you look at the pictures at the end of the staff report, the steel is what they're attaching their story poles to. Okay, it exceeded a height of 18 feet. And as far as I can tell, it was never approved by anybody, but it got built. And this is what I'm wondering. It seems to me that somebody in the, somebody in the planning or the permit department said, Go ahead and do a second floor. Go ahead and do a basement. Go ahead and do this. Go ahead and do that. 
why are we here if we're the ones that are supposed to approve that stuff? And site plan reviews and all this stuff. Like Latigo. Yeah, it's like the three-story house at Latigo. Um, how did it get built? Who was out there inspecting this? If you took the steel out of the first floor, it'd fall down. The only reason the steel's there is for the second floor. Um, so are we, are we supposed to be told, well, we thought you guys would approve it, so we went ahead and let them do it? Is that the process in the city now? Or what caused this? Because we have on page 4 of 15, we have everything we're supposed to approve tonight. A bunch of it's already been done. Um, and I assume somebody approved it. Okay, Commissioner. So how does that happen? Commissioner Hill. Well, I, I have some thoughts and concerns, but I'd, I'd like to hear an answer uh, to John's question. Commissioner Peak. Is it possible to pull up the photo from the staff report? I was going to ask Tyler to clarify the items that are requested by John and Craig by looking at the photo of the project in its current state. They've got a moment frame up that includes the second story. Well, it's the well, last page. With all due respect before. to both of you, I've worked in construction for a bit, and I do sometimes see moment frames on one-story buildings. Just well, saying. I no, just it, it, look at attachment it, four. It, I've done construction too. Anyway, okay, and then look at the other two pictures. Yeah. So okay, now those are those those story poles in the back are I beams. Okay, the structure of the building includes I beams. The you can see in the back. I beams that are over 18 feet. So, John, to be clear, what you're referencing is the I beam in picture three, which appears to be on the, if you're looking at the photo to your right. There, there's one above the structure, sort of close to the middle right, and then one further back, further right. And, and, and if you go back to picture one and two, uh, if you look at the back of your staff report, the second picture is all I-beams. These aren't the same pictures. Okay, I'm talking about... T tell me what page in the staff, staff report? Reports. These are not the pictures in the staff report. John, give a reference to what photo you're referencing in the staff report. I'm re referencing attachment four. Uh, all, all four photos show show the uh, show the second story. Got it. All four of them, but they're not the same photos that we just saw. Well, that's a great question, John. <laughs> yeah, I'm catching up. So I, uh, I never went to the site myself to take pictures, so I'm not 100% familiar, but I'm trying to catch up where you guys are at. So give me one sec here. Well, if you have the printed staff report, it's attachment four of the last page. Mm -hmm. Take it to the last page. You can see that on screen. You've got I beams coming up. The second story there. Is that legible? I do see. I do see a couple. Uh, perhaps the owner, uh, the applicant, can can um, speak to that. Uh, why why framing is up? I know what you mean. It doesn't look like the, the second floor is fully framed. The second floor area is demonstrated by the story poles, but there are some beams that uh, look to be taller than 18 feet. So I think the applicant can maybe speak to, to why that is. Mr. Byford, can we unmic him? Yeah, you, you, you can, gentlemen, and I'm, I'm, thank you very much for doing so. Um, yeah, the, 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 there are two beams that, to be, to be totally honest, the steel company put in in the only three days that I've not been on site and thought they were saving money by put them, putting them to the height of what would be approved. So they actually put four in and I cut and I got them back and got them to cut two of them down immediately. The other two, 
I used because we had to put story poles up and I thought, well, I might as well attach the story poles to them because it's just as easy for me to cut them down if we don't get through this CDP. So they just sat there. But the, as the basement concerns, that is that was all part of the previous foundations. All we're actually applying for is a change of use from what is under under the building to be a usable basement. If 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 it's denied, we just don't use it. We just have the garage down there. I mean, it was quite straightforward. You can't put a, a concrete basement under a house that's already built. So the foundations of the house were designed. And and to be to be honest with you guys, the only reason any of this was done was because the city advised me to go through two phases because they said, if you want to rebuild your house from the fires as quickly as you possibly can under the financial you know, problems you have, we suggest you put it in like this and we suggest you do a phase two that applies for a CDP. Now, if I'd known that they were going to take three years to approve phase one, I would have just done it all in one go. But unfortunately, that's the nature of how busy you guys are and that's what it is. So we find ourselves where we're, where we're at. Now, obviously, if you guys deny my submittal, I'll cut the two steel beams down and that's that. The house structure doesn't change from phase one to phase two. It's just they accidentally put it in, which you know isn't the city's fault. I've got to take that one on the chin. I apologize, but they're easy to cut down if it's a problem. Let me ask Let me you ask a question, question, please. please. Uh, uh, houses, all houses in Malibu require a garage. If you were denied this application for 923 square foot basement, how could, How could the first, the first thing, thing permitted 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 well, my finger is, where's my finger? You're going to see five, five beams above 18 feet, okay? And you're going to see a building that didn't require any steel moment frames, except for the second floor. The rest of it is framed as a normal building. Those are all in position for a second floor. Now, and then we're told, well, that's phase one and phase two. And, and I need an answer from the staff. Did anybody go out there and approve the framing? Isn't that standard? Did anybody go out there and approve the steel? Isn't that standard? Do we have inspectors that do that? Or does, or has Mr. And it's, the third question is, has Mr. Shaw ever been to the site? And I'd like an answer. Director Malika. Thank you, Chair. As the applicant stated, he, he did it without the benefit of permit. It was done, not him personally, but his contractor, uh, whoever was installing the steel. The planning department you know, the standard practice in the city is that we go out to a site when it's when construction is completed. The building inspectors are the ones that are going out there and looking at construction. However, the building inspectors only go out when called for an inspection. And I think under the recent changes in state law, it's now you only have to make an, uh, and the chair would be better at this than me, but you only need to do one progressive inspection per year. So there is a very good possibility, and I would have to talk to the building official so she could talk to her, her staff, that this was all done uh, after an inspection or, or in a window of when an inspector has not been out there yet. So there may not have been an inspection on any of this. You, you're telling me that nobody in the city, in the inspectors of the city, inspects a foundation. Is your question about the steel beams of the foundation? My, inspection, my question is about the whole process. First, they put in a basement that we're being asked to be approved. So the nobody part, inspected the foundation because so it's it, there. Then we're, we're told this, we approved a one-story house and nobody inspected the framing. 
you see that it was a two-story house. On and on and on. Nobody inspected whatever. And it's my experience, and probably Skyler's, is you go through phases on inspections. You don't put the you don't put the house, the framing up before you get your foundation inspected. All right. So let me, so, let me, let me so interject no there. One, well, go ahead. Vice Chair, I can tell you as as for a fact that our inspectors that drive around in here, when they see something go up or they've been driving down the street and all of a sudden there's wood, because wood attracts attention, right? That's why people try and get things framed. So people come by to look at it. If you're trying to sell something, wood brings you in. So trust me, when our guys are, are in the neighborhoods, and there's a lot of work over that way, obviously, they would stop in and see. If there was something wrong, they would have stopped it. And uh, I don't think anybody's done anything they're not supposed to do as far as structurally or bad workmanship or anything like that. Um, I Obviously, I think Mr. Byford would have an answer for us. Uh, he probably has the permit cards or has whatever is needed to get to where he is at this point. And um that's that's kind of how i feel about but, that but i'm asking staff because what you said is not technically true we had a house that had three stories built on it and they got caught and they came to us and they went to city council and blah 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 they ended up with their three stories but even you admitted that there's no way you build a three-story house when you have a permit for two stories including all the electrical all the plumbing that was on Latigo, I'm sure you remember it. Now, I cannot believe that we give permits to build houses and people build them totally different than what the permit says, and nobody ever inspects it until it's done. Okay. I can't believe that. Okay. Guys, so that's, that's, the two of you guys are contractors. I cannot believe that that happens. So, Vice Once Chair, it's done doing the electrical, an electricals inspector comes out there. He doesn't wait until the roof is on. <clears throat> okay, hang on, Vice Chair. Director Malika? Yes, I'd like to finish the answer. And the second half of this is the basement. That area that is going to be used as a basement now is a separate area from the garage. The garage was part of the planning and verification. And there was a crawl space, mechanical space, uh, essentially a box, if you will, behind the garage under the house. And it's my understanding from speaking with the building official, because it, I believe this, uh, from what I was under told, this is a building code issue. Uh, we can't just have a dirt space under the house. So there would be a concrete foundation or concrete that like a structural slab element. I'm getting out of my, <laughs> my league here. I, I stick with the pretty picture, the architectural and the zoning ordinances. But there would be the four uh, walls, I believe, were concrete poured, and then a slab tying it all together. But that space was not to be occupied. So they did not build something there that was not approved. Uh, I can't speak to inspection status. As the chair mentioned, they would have an inspection card to demonstrate when they called for an inspection. But that was only to be a open space a mechanical area, unlike the house on Latigo, which turned out that they did all that work without the benefit of permit and the benefit of inspections. So Richard, you're telling me, you're telling me that that area as it stands today is less than six and a half feet and it has a slab on it. And they're gonna tear, go in there and tear the slab out, dig it down another six feet or so and put a new slab in. And you're also telling me that every house that gets built in Malibu underneath the house with a crawl space has a slab. That makes no sense at all. So I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is that this particular foundation system, there is a necessity for that slab underneath, as I understand from the building official. And in this particular house, I did not specify what the height is. I'd have to scale it out from the plans, but that is what it was approved as. It's not to be a habitable space. This particular application would allow for it to become a habitable space. Okay, which means your building inspector doesn't understand that you can't go over six and a half feet without being a habitable space. And that this, this project right now is 
six and a half feet or less because we haven't approved it yet and it's got a slab on it and i i would love to see that because i don't believe it for a second and and this is this is what i'm this is my point how do we evaluate whether or not we approve something when somebody has let them already build it okay how do you order steel and steel has to be engineered for a second floor how do you order steel we don't have a permit to do a seven second floor how do you engineer it who what do you hand to the our our permit department to say this is engineered to to pass a second floor stress test so it's obviously there it's obviously engineered it was obviously put in for a second floor because it's not necessary for a first floor and it's obviously above 18 feet and it obviously has no permit because we're being asked to give one tonight okay let me let me interject here just real quick two things one uh in uh, mr byford's letter he has stated the fact that he has to take the place of the general contractor so if by chance his framer may be from this area may not be from this area and they and they or the foundation guy ordered steel he's not there that day they show up it goes up in the sky that's the problem with construction houses you got to be there every day are you honestly saying that a steel company got an order for a 25 foot high or whatever 25 foot high girder and build him for it many times over there's four or five of them sticking up and gee we made a mistake it was it was double the size height it should be are you honestly saying that I, I'm what I'm saying is the owner is not a general contractor and he's trying to run this thing on his own he may be untold that or got ordered and it's been put up that's all so he's running he's not running with somebody that's got experience such as myself or Commissioner Peak that's in this stuff all the time and if he's on his own I see it happening a lot and you so it's not 25 foot vice chair I got you I got you it's not that's not even it I'm I'm understanding from him that he's having to try and make this work after all that's gone on five years later he's still trying to get his house built and that somebody ordered it and they probably shouldn't have at this point but it was designed somebody designed it for a second story that's all I can say it just becomes without the experience of him understanding how things work and that's and the story poll the guy who erected the story pole went out there and say, gee, I don't have to put up story poles. They're already here. I mean, this is all, there's a certain point at which you have credulity. And what, what I'm talking about here is I don't mind the guy's house. I mind the fact that it appears that either the planning department or the permit department is approving houses without ever coming to us. Because it's built. It's right. there. All right. And I'll guarantee you if I go in that, that basement, it's not a six and a half foot slab. Okay. And I'll guarantee you there are thousands of houses in Malibu that do not have a slab under them. You you made your point there. I, I hear you. Uh, Commissioner Jennings? Yeah, I'd just like to uh, say that maybe we ought to talk about whether we're going to approve this project or not, rather than turning this into an attack on the planning staff or building and safety staff. If you want to make those attacks, that's fine. But I really resent you know, hijacking the meeting uh, and taking it to someplace that, you know, for, for whatever reason, uh, you have concerns about. The question I is, have a, I, I I'm resent. sorry, I have the floor, Mr. Okay, Mr. you have the floor. Speak. Yep. Um, and I think that what we need to do is focus on the business that we are assigned, which is deciding whether or not we can approve uh, this project. Um, we've spent now, what, 40 minutes on it, uh, talking about things that have to do with, well, what, should, what order it should have been done, who's at fault, who did this, who did that, has nothing to do with the ultimate determination of, uh, of this project or our, our ultimate determination of this project. And let me point out one other thing. We, it, it, the city manager sent us a copy of, of our rules and procedure 
uh, which require us to get permission of the chair before we speak, require us to speak uh, as briefly as we can and not to uh, reiterate points uh, over and over again, and uh, to maintain proper decorum and a polite approach. Uh, so far, it seems that the city manager's efforts have been wasted. No, they have not been wasted. We got attached with our little- Did you just get permission to talk? Did you? I did, yes. Did. Okay, I want permission to talk. It's Commissioner Hill's turn, go ahead. Um, okay, I, I, have, I have a point here, but just as a point of order, I think it behooves us to allow for a certain amount of give and take. If we each just have to put our hand up every single time, we're having a discourse here, a discussion. It's not a second grade classroom. So, but but I agree, John needs to be more uh, concise in his comments. Um, all right, my my main concern about this, uh, you know, I'm, my bet noir here is some roof decks seem plausible, some seem uh, problematical. This in this case. The terrain here is sort of a, a bit of a shallow bowl here with this house at the middle of, depending on how you count it, nine to 15 other houses that basically look down in on it and listen down in on it. And um, I, I know that first we'll talk about views and then, then we'll talk about sound, but I think we know of one house that has a PVD. We've heard from their owner who's, who's not concerned. He's he's happy with it. That's great. There are a bunch of other houses that look down on it from above. And unfortunately, because the council put in the no new PVD uh, post-Woolsey rule, I, you know, they sort of used a shotgun where they could have used a scalpel. And I just wonder how many of the other houses up above there would have issues with this but couldn't get a PVD because they're they're not allowed now in that territory. So that, that's kind of a concern hanging out or a question mark hanging out there. Um, with respect to sound and noise though, I think, I think this does fall in the category of those ones that I tend to rail about. Uh, you know, when I've mentioned, and I'll say it again here for the record that the general plan talks about privacy 14 times and the word private appears 126 times. And it's just part of the, the bundle of rights that private property owners have here, uh, the quiet enjoyment. So the solution to my mind here, basically, and as it says before, I think it's one thing if you've got a little deck that's, you know, a few couples could watch the sunset from or the family could eat dinner. It's another thing if you have a big deck that could really sustain a big party. Here we've got over a thousand square feet. If you figure six to eight people per a hundred feet, square feet, that's like 80 people could be on this deck the way it's configured now. So my solution would be to say, for a couple reasons, you could keep, and, and this would be helpful if you guys want to look at um, sheet A2, the second floor plan, um, or it's probably on the roof plan too, but second floor plan A2, if you're looking at the PDF, it's 39 of 69. Um, there are three decks the way this is configured, two of which connect to each other. The third is separate. I, I would suggest that you could keep the two smaller decks, the south deck that's in front of the master bedroom exclusively, and the east deck, which is next to the master bedroom. And those are both relatively small. Both would have nice sunsets and so forth. It's the, the problematic one is the kitchen roof deck which is much bigger than the other two. Um, and it's also much more exposed in terms of sound and privacy and all that to all the other houses up above the site. The, uh, the, two, the two smaller decks are shielded from the houses up above by the second floor of this house. So they're sort of tucked in in front of the second floor. They have nice views out towards the ocean. Whereas the big one over the kitchen roof deck is just like, it's a platform, it's a stage. They could do, you know, Shakespeare or The Who at the Coliseum playing a rock concert up, up to all the houses up above. And I just think that that 
based on what we just heard from the applicant, they don't necessarily need that space. It's a family if, if we take them at their word. And I think it would be, my motion would be to approve the project as is, but including the two smaller decks and excising the, the large, what I have to call a party deck. Do I have a uh, second for that motion? Apparently not. Well, that's out there on the table. That's a thought to think about, all right? I'll second it. All right, so we have we have that motion on the table. Motion to approval subject to losing the biggest of the three decks. Oh, uh, you're, you're muted. I, I have other comments to make. Hang on. Um, sorry, uh, Director Malika. So now you're muted. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Sorry, remember to take the hand. I remember to take the hand down, but not that. Uh, to just to get to Commissioner Hill's question about PVDs, the intention of what the the City Council did was to preclude somebody or prevent them from claiming a view now that was newly acquired because the house was gone or landscaping or something like that burned and was destroyed in the fire. However, if somebody comes in, because I don't believe um, that it was the intention of the uh, of the commission uh, excuse me, the city council to let folks uh, take advantage of the situation and, and block their neighbors so we have been responding to neighbor concerns uh, when they see story polls uh, we have done the best that we can to make certain that the new development uh, is treated you know uh, every it's fair for all parties we, we've we have worked with the city attorney's office on that and we have gone out and, and taken photographs uh, to, to see that uh, the the part that was not there before does not create a new impact. Because the idea of the fire rebuild provisions were to essentially let people get back what they had um, without someone gaining a, a benefit. Have you issued any PVDs in the Malibu Park area since that rule? I don't know if I'd say we've... We've taken photographs, because I keep thinking there's one up there. I want to say it was for, um, oh, geez, at the upper corner there before Horizon Drive, uh, we worked with uh, two homeowners because the the, the person behind, uh, there was a potential for a view impact. We looked at the story polls and saw that the new development would impact it, and uh, we had the owner do a redesign so that the the building uh, would allow for the owner behind to maintain his view. But they, they didn't actually get the official PVD. Because I, I, my, my take is that at least the public perception up there is, yeah, you can't get one now. So there may be people up there who thought, wow, I didn't realize this house was going to be, or there was going to be a roof deck, whatever, uh, whatever their concern might have been. And they just said, well, you know, we've been told we can't even think about that. So um, question mark. Can I add one thing real quick to that? Please. Sorry, is um, Richard? I think the moratorium for um, structures is 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 over now, right? For 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 PBE, I think it's the the moratorium for vegetation is still in effect, if I remember correctly. So I I think that someone could get a PVD. I'll double check on that, but uh, mm -hmm. for for structure specifically, I never heard there was a difference, but. I would like to look at, I forget, I think it's ordinance 495 perhaps, but I'd want to look yeah. at that one more time. Can yeah, I no worries. Okay, hang on, Vice Chair. Uh, Commissioner Peek. Um, yeah, I just wanted to clarify that in regards to that issue, when I was on the city council and we discussed that, the intention was that, you know, merely what was stated, so I don't need to go into that anymore. But um, I don't have an issue with the roof deck. I I think that, so... This this project as it stands right now, you have an owner that's gone to his neighbors and talked to his neighbors. He stated that we had Craig reach out to a neighbor, and then that neighbor clearly reaffirmed, "Look, we I've talked with the guy. I don't have an issue with it. Um, I don't see the reason as why we don't want to merely just allow a roof deck, which somebody is entitled to do. Um, I think that." John has some actually some good points here. Like it's very frustrating for me when I look at this and we clearly see steel is in concrete or somehow structurally in there. 
I don't know if it's tied down or what it is, or the bolts were in concrete and they were intended for a two story. I think, you know, Mr. Byford is honest and saying, you know, they might have messed up a little bit. I was fully intending to do a second story. And, you know, I was kind of given the direction and this is the direction that I took and this is where we're at now. So, you know, that's super frustrating. He'll deal with that when the inspectors, he doesn't have a choice not to, whether, however, they're going to look at it. Um, there are multiple inspections that happen from foundations to nailing, to steel, to framing, to electrical, to plumbing, you know, you name it. And they happen at different courses throughout a project. You know, somebody can get that framing done when all of it's framed. Usually it's done in different stages. I would make a recommendation, um, Richard, that when inspections are being, usually there's a planning inspection at the beginning of the meeting, there's a planning inspection at or the beginning of a project and at the end of the project. I would think it's wise for staff to do a planning inspection like somewhere around the time of final framing if it's not done. I you know sometimes it's done maybe on a roof height, but then also like post drywall. Like let's really make sure that what we're saying is, you know, what we got is what we got here. Um, I don't know how that would equate into staff schedule. I know that that's crazy and whatnot, but I think that that may eliminate some of the, the concerns in something like maybe not the drywall one, but if something was done during framing, what, what John and what we've all witnessed here with steel coming out at a way different height would have been eliminated. Right. And we wouldn't be having to spend so much time on that. So, but re regardless of that, it, when I'm looking at the project as a whole, I don't see an objection to it pending a landscape plan that's approved by our city biologist. And I don't have an issue with that. So I would amend the motion to say that, but I don't know if I need to make a new motion or how we're going to deal with that. Okay. Hang on, Vice Chair. Got Commissioner Jennings. Um, yeah, uh, the I had a couple of questions. The hedges that have been put in place are ficus, as, as I read the staff report. Um, those things will grow yeah. 50, 60 feet. Um, and how are you going to keep, uh, is it going to be a, con a condition to the permit that those remain uh, trimmed at the allowed height? How, how's that going to be handled? a very good question yeah. it's typically it's, a standard condition staff, but let me make sure it's it's included here it's answered in the staff report if i may ask a question of the chairman i'm, I'm sorry I'm, I'm just, I, I know but you we surrendered your time to skyler and I, then it goes right back not, to you no, 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 without no, chair, coming to me vice chair he's not done yet hang on i had a question about the hedges i have another question about the uh Condition 60, which um, I think misstates what we have done in the past. 60 says no furniture or other attachment, whether temporary or fixed, may be placed on the rooftop deck overnight. What we've done in the past is to limit anything that would be on the deck to a maximum height of 18 feet. If it's over 18 feet, it has to be removed overnight. So that would be one change that I would support. If if that were a friendly amendment to my motion on the table, I would accept that. Um, I've got lost track of who's got a motion on the table. Um, I I, oh, you had a motion on the table, right? You were going to approve it, uh, but it with but eliminating the roof deck, well, keeping two of the three roof decks, right? But I'm not going to support that. I agree with Skyler on the on the roof deck issue. Yeah, I mean it. it I understand we've had this discussion before. Yeah. I understand that you feel that you can you can impose whatever restrictions you think are appropriate if you can tie them back somewhere to the general plan or the LIP or whatever. I just don't agree with that approach. I think if, if the city council wants to eliminate roof decks or condition roof decks in a certain way, that's up to the city council to do that. I don't think that that's appropriately our job. I'm just linking, linking them back to privacy rights that are constitutional and articulated here many times. Different constitution than the one I'm familiar with. All right. Go ahead. It's a Supreme Court interpolation, but now we're splitting hairs. 
Okay, <laughs> Vice Chair Mazza. Okay, um, number one, I just want to answer one one thing that Jeff said. Uh, we got this thing about procedures in our package. And he said, oh, you don't follow them. Well, the very, the very first procedure, very second one, 1B, says basically that Robert Smith is not, Dennis is not the chairman. Okay. It's very specific. Okay. Now, what? when it comes to view rights and, and uh, view determinations in the burn area, we allowed and the city council voted to allow on appeal the movement of a second floor to block a view on, on Hillary Heights, a building, okay? We voted for it. It was appealed and the city council voted for it. So that, what was stated before is not true, okay? Now, what we need to understand here and and you guys are going to pass this and Jeff has his approve anything attitude but we are being asked to approve page four in, uh, proposed scope of work okay it's already there half part of it so that can't be denied cannot be denied so that's what I'm talking about it has nothing to do with this particular house. It has to do with the the conduct of either the planning department or the permit department. And you guys are, who are, are contractors know that there's not one one inspection at the beginning of the house and one at the end. Okay, there's more inspections. That's what I object to in this situation. Now, as far as as far as Jeff was talking about the ficus. I forgot to disclose that, that Craig and I measured it. Okay? It's eight feet, not six, on the sides, and it's six feet with seven foot pillars in the front, as it stands today. Okay? As it stands today. And we're supposed to be approving this again. But city busted them, and there it is again. So I just want to point that out. So when, when the city ignores its only own codes officially, and we've had many a meeting here where there's a permit department employee here, when they ignore it, they have to stand up and admit they ignored it, as far as I'm concerned, or I cannot approve something ex post facto because some clerk decided to let them do it. Or some planner. That's that's just my opinion. So I've seconded the motion, and uh, we can go on from there. Okay, Director Malika. Thank you, thank you, Chair. I want to answer Commissioner Jennings' question. Uh, it's condition number twenty-six requires that the hedges be trimmed consistent with the municipal code and LCP. Uh, six feet on the side and rear, forty-two in the front. And then uh, we, Tyler, you don't see an issue with modifying condition number 60 uh, if per uh, Commissioner Jennings' comment that no furniture or other attachment uh, in ex 18 feet or in excess of 18 feet. Uh, correct, Tyler? Correct. Yeah, 18 feet, I guess, would be a little more lenient. Uh, I think the way the condition's written is like, you know, top of top of ground language would be a little 18 feet. But yes, we can definitely add the specific language. I, I, I hold on. I think that the 18 feet is that's from the ground level. That's where that's coming from. I think Jeff, maybe. Yes, you're right. And the reason I said it is that the condition says that you can't leave anything on the roof deck. That means if you had a low table or a low pot or a low anything, you would have to take them down every night. That's why I'm saying that the, the, it doesn't talk about the top of railing. It yeah. talks about nothing. I think, but what you're saying is that it should be top of railing or it's, 18 feet? It, top of railing or 18 feet, and it's, it's like three inches difference, I think. The top of railing yeah. okay. is, is just right there at 18 feet. 
Got it. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Okay, so we we've, we've got a motion in a second. Um, we can take we can take a, a roll call on that and see what happens, just so we can keep this thing moving. Um, I think we should do that. Uh, Rebecca, do you want to? Uh, the 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 motion was they they it's been they approve it. Uh, Commissioner uh, Vice Chair Maza and second by I believe Commissioner Hill, and they would approve it, but they were hesitant on the deck size for Mr. for Commissioner Hill. It was to remove the deck. Remove There's the deck. Two of three. Three. that's right. Two Keep two of three. Keep, Keep two of three. So, with that, we can take a vote and see and see where we are with that. So, Rebecca, can you give us a roll call, please? Of course. And just a point of clarification, I believe Commissioner Hill made the motion seconded by Vice Chair Maza. Okay. Thank Commissioner you. Hill? Yes. Vice Chair Maza? Yes. Commissioner Jennings? No. Commissioner Peake? No. Chair Smith? No. Motion fails. Okay. Chair Mr. Jennings. I'll move the staff recommendation with uh, the two changes. One, the uh, amended uh, condition that Tyler mentioned during his presentation. And two, the change uh, in condition 60 to uh, add the limiting factor of 18 feet or the top of the roof height or the uh, railing height. They're both right there together, either one. Uh, Chair Smith? Yes. I'd like to second that, but uh, just for a point of clarification, Jeff, you were referencing the landscape plan that would be required to be submitted? That's the, yes, that's the condition okay. that Tyler talked okay. about. All right. Thank you. Okay. Let's take a vote. Rebecca, please. Commissioner Jennings? Yes. Commissioner Peak. Yes. Commissioner Hill? Unfortunately, no. Vice Chair Mazza? No. Chair Smith? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Uh, we take a break. Yeah, 846. Let's take, um, I don't know, come back at, you guys need 10 minutes or eight minutes, seven minutes, eight minutes? Back at 855. There we go. Everyone, please make sure to turn off both camera and audio. Thank you. It more throughout the week, but I think we should be good. Yeah, I don't see any issues. No, yeah, you just, um, when, oh, I shouldn't turn those on. They can hear it in the thing. Probably hear me yelling at things right now. Um...
that one went on. I don't know what Sorry, I'm just gonna look this up real quick. Sometimes, see? Now I got it on. And it's fine? Yeah. Dennis, I'm present in the meeting whenever the rest of the group rejoins. I'll be ready to go. Okie dokie.
fit with the inflection. Where are you going? Oh. Shoes. 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 She's obsessed with shoes, babe. She's got your flip flops. I know it's gross. Okay. <laughs> We're up to date. Who's Richard Smith? Why are you asking? No, it, it was Robert Smith, he said. And is, is that Dennis's oh. middle name? What's your name, Dennis? Oh, 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 okay. Yeah. But, and the rules that were adopted back all those years ago referred specifically to Dennis Smith. <laughs> well, uh, if you can read, Jeff, you read number B. Right, gentlemen, two. gentlemen, gentlemen, gentlemen. That's all you have to do is read it. Yeah. Just being collegial. It's Dennis Robert Smith. Yes. Um, okay. Here we go. Uh, here we are. We're back to uh, back to uh, the meeting. Here we're open, and uh, we are on five C. And that is let me put these on. Posted development permit number twenty dash zero five five, minor modification number twenty one dash zero one zero, and demolition permit number two zero dash two. 20-025, an application for the demolition of an existing single family residence, conversion of an ex existing guest house into primary residence and associated development. We have a staff report and it's Mr. Canland. I think he's one of our new contract planners, am I correct? Um, he's correct. chair. You are correct. He is. I think if I'm got so many different consultants these days, Civic Solutions, I believe. And yes, uh, he is. This is his. Uh, we're we're still within, I think, uh, six months of being with the city. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Welcome, Mr. Canland. Thank you. Uh, tonight, uh, I will be presenting um, the item before you for a coastal development permit number 20-055, minor modification number 21-010, and demolition permit 20-025. Uh, the project is an application for the demolition of an existing single family residence, conversion of the existing guest house into the primary residence and associated development. Next slide, please. Uh, the image before you is a vicinity and aerial map that shows the location of a project on Mallard Creek Road that is fronting the Pacific Ocean. Next slide, please. And the image before you is the current site conditions. Uh, the photograph does show a number of cars uh, in, in front of the home. That viewpoint uh, will lead to the need for the minor modification. So the photo was selected specifically for um, the existing condition uh, related to the minor modification. Next slide, please. The proposed project is the demolition of an existing single family residence, remodel and conversion of the guest house and garage into the new primary dwelling, remodel of the detached tea house, grading, hardscape, including patio, pavers and wood decks, landscaping, OWTS and associated development. The proposed project is a little unique in the fact that the existing home will be demolished, TDSF is not to be reduced, and the existing guest house will be remodeled to uh, allow for the home as the primary space with the garage spaces that will be provided. The location specifically does have a seawall, and we'll speak to that a little bit later in the presentation. In addition, the location does have some existing non-conforming setbacks that we'll discuss. Next slide, please. On the site plan, it shows that the post project will be demolished, which is the existing home, 
and there is a tea house that will be uh, behind the existing home that will be upgraded. Next slide, please. On this uh, site plan shows the existing home as it relates to setbacks and the uh, removal of the uh, tea house with the pool to remain. Next slide, please. And for clarification purposes, there was a change to condition 21. The reason for that is because condition 21 is speaking to language on the view corridor. Uh, so that language uh, will be read into the record for modification. The original view corridor condition uh, should be modified to the updated condition. Uh, next slide, please. And the updated condition number 21 should read pursuant to LIP section 6.5E 2E. And in order to ensure the protection of scenic and visual resources, the applicant is required to maintain a view corridor a minimum of six feet adjacent to the western property line extending to the length of the property. No portion of the structure shall extend into the view corridor above the elevation of the adjacent street. Any Fencing across the view corridor shall be permanently maintained as visually permeable, tinted or frosted glass. The roped or slated screen fences are not permitted. Any landscaping in this area shall be included with only low growing species that will not obscure or block blue water views. If at any time the property owner allows for the view corridor to become impaired or blocked, it would, be, it would constitute a violation of the coastal development permit and the Coastal Act and subject to all civil and criminal remedies. Next slide, please. And uh, for purposes of updates to the staff report presented to you for corrections, uh, page three of the staff report states incorrectly that the existing guest residence is a 14 foot yard setback. I wanted to clarify that note it was brought to attention with collaboration with the uh, applicant that the guest residence is currently set back to 35 feet 10 inches. And for page four, uh, states that the guest house remodel is, is resulting in that decrease in TDSF. The TDSF is not changing, so I just wanted to clarify that as well. Page six, table three, zoning conformance notes incorrectly that the development may only be cited on slopes flatter than a four to one ratio. The standard is three to one or flatter. And page five states incorrectly that the property doesn't have a shoreline protective device. As stated earlier in the presentation, the property does have an existing seawall, which was re-permitted and reconstructed after it was damaged in the 2007 fire. I did also want to provide an updated clarification as well. There was discussion currently with coastal engineering on a concurrent plan check process in regards to plan check corrections. Coastal engineer did provide an approval. However, on clarification on the referral sheet, there was a note in regards to the concurrent processing uh, with the building plan check plans, and therefore they may have additional comments related to the processing. So I wanted to provide that correction as well for our presentation this evening. Next slide, please. <laughs> and at this time, Staff is recommending adoption of Planning Commission Resolution Number 23-30, determining that the project is categorically exempt from the California Quality Environmental Quality Act and approving the Coastal Development Permit Number CDP 20-055 for the demolition of the existing 2,176 square foot, two-story single-family residence, conversion of an existing 1,700 and 53 square foot guest house into the primary residence, remodel of an existing tea house, grading, landscaping, hardscape, and replacement of the on-site water, wastewater treatment system, including minor modification number 21-010, or up to a 50% reduction of the front yard setback and demolition permit number 20-025, for the full demolition of the existing single family residence, and less than 50% demolition of the tea house located on a beach front lot in the single family medium zoning district at 23746 Malibu Road. 
And at this time, that concludes staff's presentation. And I can open that up for any questions. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, disclosures. I see, oh, Vice or uh, Commissioner Hill, your hand is up. And you get it. There we go. Yeah, um, disclosures. Uh, what I was going to say with my hand was that I have lots of questions, but I would save them till after a comment and when we get to discussion. For disclosures, uh, let's see, I visited the site, looked at it from the front, went around, hiked around, looked at it from the beach side. Um, I, I noticed there's already a lot of corrosion in the bolts on the bulkhead, such that to my, well, I'm a lay person, but I've spent, you know, 50 plus years on the beach looking at things that corrode and, and need repair on the beach. Looks like that bulkhead will last maybe a few more decades, maybe. Um, looked out over the deck by the tea house. Some of the boards have been pulled up in the decking. There's uh, digging up a big pile of sand from beneath. I don't know if that's what that's for, whether it's relevant. Might be a test bore or uh, something septic related. Sent some questions to staff about the data for the sea rise and the FEMA numbers. It appeared there are a few missing values. I have received no reply on that. Hopefully we have that data here tonight. And I, I just, I would add too that the staff report says that the request to reduce the required front yard setback does not adversely affect neighborhood character. And that may or may not turn out to be true, but it, it's kind of a conclusory opinion. So um, just pointing that out. Those are my disclosures. Commissioner Peak. I have visited the site and with um, Don Schmitz last week. Didn't learn anything that I can't see from what we're looking at. Thank you. Commissioner Hill, would you take your little yellow hand down, please? Thank you for reminding me. Oh, I do have I do have questions, though, but, but that's fine. But right now, okay. um, Commissioner Jennings, I met with Don Schmitz last week, um, went over uh, and in fact, we went over the, the condition 21 um, talking about that and the various aspects of it and how how you deal with the view corridor issue on, on areas of Malibu Road, which are level with the road. Um, and uh, that, that was about it. And I, too, met with uh, Mr. Schmitz and walked through that fabulous old property. Unbelievable. Um, but uh, didn't learn anything else that's not already in the staff report. Um, okay, so we go to public comment. Uh, I need to disclose. I do. Oh, I'm sorry. It and saw nothing that was in the staff report. Okay, thank you. Um, public comment? Yes, um, we'll open for Don Schmitz. If um, Alex and Parker, you could bring up his presentation. Good evening, Chair Smith, uh, Vice Chair Mazza, Planning Commissioners, uh, Chris Pelo for Schmitz and Associates, uh, on behalf of the applicant, Capricorn West Coast LLC. Uh, Don wanted me to convey his apologies. He had a family emergency, had to step away. So uh, I'll be representing the applicant this evening. And thank you for the, uh, for the presentation. Um, so yeah, the, the project we have before us this evening uh, is a remodel of an existing tea house, uh, demolition of the existing single family residence, uh, which is located in between this pool that you see in the in the slide right here and the tea house. Um, so the opening up the views to the beach, uh, the the client, the applicant wants to create a sense of uh, sort of a Zen garden and a sense of relaxation on this property. It's a very long property, uh, as you can tell from the site plan uh, shown in the uh, Mr. Canlin's uh, presentation. Um, this is uh, approximately half of the property you're looking at right now. Uh, next slide, please. So here, this is the location we're talking about where the existing single family residence is and where it is being demolished. Uh, we are demoing that. Next, please. Remodeling the tea house, which is uh, in, the, in the front to uh, 
reduce the interior square footage of that structure and create a, a covered outdoor area, uh, which is where the table is shown to the right. Next, please. Uh, the guest house in the front is currently a, a, a second unit that is occupied. We are uh, basically demolishing the main unit, residential unit, and uh, going, the, the owner is going to be utilizing uh, the remodeled uh, uh, accessory dwelling unit as their uh, main residence. Next slide, please. So as you can see, the total development square footage on the property is going to be reduced significantly by over half. Uh, the existing main residence is two stories in height and a little over 2,000 square feet. That is being completely eliminated. Um, and, uh, and we're left with the front house, which is approximately 1,760 square feet of memory serves. Next slide, please. This is uh, an aerial rendering showing what the property will look like after uh, the, the demolition of the main residence, which is roughly located where that uh, nice green open section is of, of lawn and, and the, uh, the art object there. Next slide, please. Again, this is that the, the previous rendering that we were just looking at, looking towards the ocean. Uh, with your back toward the guest house, uh, this is the view towards the ocean. Next slide, please. This is the reverse uh, looking, turning 180 degrees, looking back toward Malibu Road. Uh, you can see there's an existing eight, uh, roughly eight foot tall wall uh, on the left side and a similar uh, wall uh, or fence on the, um, the eastern side of the property. Uh, those are current conditions. And this is looking towards the south facing elevation of the remodeled guest house. Next slide, please. This is sort of a 45 degree angle. It gives you a little bit more color what the landscaping and feel uh, is of the project. Um, it was done by Rios uh, Architects and it's a, it's a lovely design. Um, really enjoy working with them. They do very, very good work. And here you can see just how, you know, how open and, and beautiful uh, of a setting we're trying to create uh, with the modest development that is in front. Next slide, please. This is uh, an interior rendering of the remodeled tea house. Uh, you can see that you have that little covered uh, loggia area um, that used to be interior space uh, for the tea house. Um, this demo comes out to approximately 36% uh, demo of the exterior walls in order to accomplish this remodel. On the front uh, guest house remodel, I think it's approximately 34% demolition. So we're well under the uh, demo percentages of the remodel policy, and therefore we are able to uh, maintain our legal non-conforming um, uh, development standards with respect to uh, both buildings. Next slide, please. So this is a front uh, uh, rendering of the how the project will look post uh, post development. Uh, the existing building is 35 feet, 10 feet tall, 10 inches tall. Um, you can see the garage spaces are, are one and two are right there through one of them's through the, uh, the glass fence. We're proposing a minor modification that would allow us to input in this fence um, and, the, uh, and the wall adjacent along with the pedestrian uh, entrance to the far left. Uh, this will be located 10 feet from the street right of way and the property line. So we're requesting a 10 foot setback to allow uh, that uh, vehicle gate uh, and wall and pedestrian gate to be constructed um, outside of the front yard setback. Next slide, please. So you can see the project can complies with all standards in the LCP. Uh, and I thank you very much, John, uh, for your presentation and for, for all your excellent help on the project. I really, really appreciate it. John is uh, uh, one of the, the, the few contract planners I've really had a chance to work with and I really enjoy working with him. He does a great job for the city and I just want to thank him for that and let you guys know he's doing a good job. Um, the minor modification request that we have here is for a 50% reduction in the front yard setback, um, which I will be demonstrating uh, in my presentation is, is consistent with the neighborhood character. Next slide, please. So here we have the existing setback from uh, the Malibu Road right of way. Uh, which is 35 feet, 10 inches. Uh, next, please. 
the existing setback would be 20 feet as required by code would be 20 feet. We already, you know, comply with that setback and in, in spades. Uh, and we are now proposing next, please. Proposing to reduce it in half as stated before, so that we can uh, facilitate the construction of that wall with the planter and the, uh, the vehicle gate that will allow the applicant to uh, provide for some security to the property, as well as some privacy. Uh, you will notice that the view corridor located on the far uh, western side of the property, uh, the, the, uh, the fence in that area is all glass. It's completely see-through and it's consistent with the view corridor policies and all new development that is proposed as part of this project, all landscaping, everything within that view corridor complies with the view corridor standards in that it is either view permeable or located entirely below road grade as is required by LIP 6.5E2. Next slide, please. That is the location of the sliding gate and, uh, 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 and glass fence and pedestrian walkway. Next slide. So staff has found that uh, a majority of the neighboring parcels are developed with dwellings within the front yard setbacks. Uh, or with separate, I should say, with front yard setbacks at the same distance or less uh, significantly. Next, please. Here you can see our, our project, our current uh, uh, setback is 35 feet and uh, 10 inches, which is the second greatest setback on this section of Malibu Road within 500 feet. Uh, the average setback is 12 and a half feet. Our proposed 10 foot setback, and this is for building setbacks, mind you. Our proposed building will remain at 35 feet. Next slide, please. But structure setbacks within the uh, the, uh, the front yards of these that are not structures um, average 7.4 feet. Um, so yeah, again, that is you know our, our 10 feet is well consistent with the 7.4 feet of setback. Next slide. So here is roughly the line of the right of way as shown in the, the dash yellow. Um, and you can see uh, that the line of houses for the predominantly are very close to the right of way. Our residence is uh, on the far left hand side next to the tennis court lot. Uh, and you can see it, it has the greatest setback of any of them. And when we readjust for the gate, it'll be very consistent with the prevailing setbacks along this section of Malibu Road. Next slide, please. And the project uh, uh, is consistent with the neighborhood character. Next slide. Again, this is sort of a zoomed in um, uh, view showing you the subject property in the red and the, the prevailing frontage. Next slide. This is a nearby uh, residence and I'll give you a couple of examples of, of similar situated properties. Uh, you can see that yellow line is supposed to be on the on the ground. You're supposed to imagine that it's literally about two feet away from from that fence on the right hand side. Um, and you can see we're, what we're proposing is has about eight feet more of setback than this line. Next. Similar situation here. Very, very small front yard setback. Next slide. And a uh, similar situation here. This is probably comparable uh, with what we were looking at on our project. Next slide. This one actually has a negative uh, setback and encroaches the, the fencing there encroaches into the public right of way. Next slide. So, as you can see, the existing house in the middle, we have the, uh, uh, the residences to the left and the right are both going to be located well closer to the street uh, than our development project, even after we do the, uh, the development in the driveway, the, the fence and the planter box. So uh, we really feel strongly that uh, the findings can be made for, for neighborhood character consistency. Next slide. And again, this is the rendering of how the project will look uh, after uh, the development is done. Next slide. So before and after just gives you some perspective of what we're trying to achieve here. Next. So in conclusion, uh, the CDP application, uh, this involves a, a more than 50% reduction of the development square footage, uh, reduction in the massing. Um, we're bringing a legal non-conforming second unit into conformance with the uh, TDF, with the square footage uh, requirements, because you can't have larger than a 900 square foot guest house. 
well, we're converting it into the main residence and bringing that into conformance. Um, next. So the reduced front yard setbacks will contain a sliding gate, pedestrian, uh, and can't see with the video, but uh, and a raised planter and, uh, and a sliding gate. Next. It does have one of the largest existing front yard setbacks of any uh, lot as shown on Malibu Road. And even with the reduced setback for the fence, the predominant uh, bulk of development is gonna be set back still farther than just about any development on Malibu Road. Next slide. Our project is similarly situated to other uh, developments as shown and, uh, and are consistent with the neighborhood character. Next slide. Thank you very much. Um, I will reserve the rest of my time for rebuttal if there are any comments and I am available for any questions that the commissioners may have. Thank you very much for your time. If there are any other members of the public present in the meeting who wish to provide comment, please click the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen now. And seeing none. Okay, in that case, back to us. Um, first up was uh, Commissioner Hill. <clears throat> oh, sorry, beat you, John. Um, yeah, I, uh, broadly, just, you know, big, big terms here. This looks like a smart approach. Managed retreat, moving the house back from the beach. Um, seems like, you know, just generally speaking, we're going in the right direction here. I do have a number of questions about some of the data with respect to sea rise, FEMA flood, and potential impacts on the uh, septic dispersal area. Um, and so maybe it, I should just try to get some of these more technical questions out first. Um, the narrative in the staff report gave us, there are basically four potential sea rise numbers that could be in play here. It gave us three of the four. I, it didn't give us the fourth. And I, I put in an email to staff um, hoping to get that number. Basically, we have a choice between do we look at 40 year or do we look at 100 year? And I think it makes sense in this case to look at 40 year, right? Because it's a, it's basically where this is a developed property. Um, and then the choice is, do we look at low risk avoidance or medium risk avoidance uh, or risk aversion is the technical phrase. And normally we look at medium risk aversion, sort of the, the, the prudent sea level rise number. We got the 40 year low aversion 1.75 feet, but we didn't get the 40 year medium risk aversion number. Do, do staff, have you figured out what that number is? Uh, yes, I can speak to that. Uh, thank you. There was a response uh, in regards to uh, the request for the medium risk aversion. However, that was uh, provided via email correspondence, but I'm happy to uh, respond that we do have. I didn't number. get anything, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Pardon. Um, I am happy to respond that we uh, do have that number. However, it was provided via email. That correspondence was 2.6 feet. Okay, so we're looking at 2.6 foot rise. And then we'll keep that in our, our back of our minds. Looking at the FEMA flood zones, I just have some questions. It was a little confusing about what, what's really relevant and what we're looking at. Um, okay, so the first question is, which flood data do we use for FEMA? There's a 2008 that was superseded. There's a 2016. Uh, I know recently that th that was updated again. Um, and so the first question is, which, you know, given the entitlements and the timing, I'm assuming we are looking at the 2016 number. Is that, would that be correct? My understanding is that is correct. It's the 2016 number. Unfortunately, the responses are in email format, but um, the correspondence does relate to 2016 version being applicable. Okay. Once again, I'm sorry, I did not receive an email. Um, okay. So if we're, if we're using that, the sheet G0.10, 
for those of you playing along at home, shows a red line corresponding to the 2016 zone VE. That's, so that would be the, the number that we're using, uh, 2016 data. That happens to be six feet higher than the 2008 zone VE. What we don't see on that plan are newer 2016 versions of the other lines. For example, the zone A, E, X, and zone D, uh, they're not on the, on the map there. Now, presumably those would all change by approximately the same six foot uh, delta between 2008 and 2016. I'm not assuming that the change would be linear, not necessarily six feet, but, but in any case, a substantial difference. Right now, the problem is the potential problem. Uh, for example, the boundary between zone X and zone D is at 12 foot elevation under the 2008 data. Uh, the house is at about 13 feet and street level is about 14 feet. So if that boundary changed and the AE boundary zone changed by the same six feet, even though the house is only two feet higher, that basically says that the house would be in the 2016 AE zone, the house would be flooded by a couple feet. And again, the AE zone is uh, the base flood elevation plus up to a three foot wave. The VE zone is the base flood elevation plus greater than a three foot wave. So we have potential wave action here. We didn't have the data for that <laughs> in front of us. And that may be fine if we're talking about 40 years, but then my questions and the concerns are about, A, the bulkhead looks like it maybe has a couple decades and Coastal <laughs> doesn't want us to be rebuilding those or repairing those. And, and in any case, these calculations are done without the bulkhead there. So. We have to assume that that's out of the equation. And so then we're left with the septic dispersal area is definitely right there within uh, what would be the updated 2016 zone AE. So it looks like we get some flooding to that, to the septic dispersal area, if not the house also. So I'm just, it, this is a question in my mind. It just feels like, Something doesn't add up there. We're 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 expecting the house may flood. I wonder if somebody can assuage me here. Um, and I, I can certainly uh, field part of that question and defer back to uh, coastal engineering for further clarification um, okay. on their analysis. Essentially, what occurred was the coastal engineering reviewed the project. However, under plan check. They had additional comments related to um, the current plan. Um, their initial determination was that the project complied and therefore was approved. Uh, they had a 2.6, um, pardon me, a two foot, um, 0.6 foot SLR and the uprush limit was 1.75. Essentially, they reviewed the plans from my understanding that it did comply. However, because they did provide follow-up at this time, I wouldn't necessarily feel comfortable speaking specifically to their current analysis since I believe they still have provided comments that have not been addressed on the building plan check portion mm. of that. Just so I understand, it, um, they used the 40-year low risk avoid aversion of 1.75 feet. What we didn't see was the medium risk aversion of 2.6 foot. Sea level rise. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So that seems like this is a potential concern that's just kind of hanging out there. Let me see if I have any other comments that relate directly to that. Um, well, is it not the case that the Coastal Commission will not allow a damaged bulkhead to be replaced at this point? As, 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 when it goes, it goes, right? My understanding, I would probably defer at this point to our director as far as typical procedures the city has uh, been working with Coastal Commission is that for emergency repairs for life and safety, there are repairs that may occur. However, replacing the structure altogether may not be allowed. And I can certainly defer to our director for a follow-up on that. 
Richard? Yes, so there is a provision for repairs and uh, 10.6B of the LIP, uh, essentially you, you get a repair to protect the structure, but then you have to, uh, then I say you being the, uh, the property owner must execute a deed restriction per uh, that section that essentially acknowledges that there are no future repairs or replacement of that seawall. Uh, and that's section 10.6B. So uh, that section is not added to this application uh, because that, that starts with one approving a repair or a new seawall, and then it, it goes on. So this is 10.6A in which we just require them to acknowledge that they're subject to wave hazards, but they're allowed essentially a repair or one, or one replacement uh, to protect the structure. Okay, and then I, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, I, I wanted to throw in their existing structure because you can't build a seawall to protect the new structure. Right, okay. Um, and then the coastal engineering report did have some concerns and, and sort of caveats suggesting that there could be some overtopping and some flooding and whatnot. Um, and they suggested one adaptive strategy could include hooking up to the sewer system which phase is this parcel in and how, how soon would, would the sewer solution, is that a realistic part of this picture or when does that happen? John, I believe this is phase three. Am I understanding that correctly? Um, my understanding, um, I believe it's in phase two. Oh, sorry. Yes, phase yes. Two. Sorry, I misread that. So what do we infer from that? Presumably that would definitely be hooked up in time before the bulkhead starts to fail or? Ideally, that's going to happen shortly in the near future. Yeah. I don't think Public Works has a confirmed start time, uh, but I do know that they are working on that phase. And I think the goal was actually to have it already implemented, but we've run into setbacks as a city. Yeah. Um, okay. So... This, the setback and the gate, uh, this is, seems like a much more minor issue to me. Um, what's the point of the view permeable gate if it doesn't look out to the ocean at all? There's really no view other than of the house. Is that, I, I guess I, I didn't understand the requirement up until now. If it, if it doesn't matter if there's a view, why does it need to be permeable? Essentially complying with the standards of the provisions of the code. Um, the existing home does have a block to the, the view of the ocean. Mm -hmm. However, installing any structures or allowing for any existing structures, they should be compliant with the code. So um, okay. the, the, the necessary requirements are still applicable. Um, okay. I guess my last comment would just be that in the report, it, it, on the, on the, I'm sorry, not in the report, on the architect's plans, it states that they were already given as, as a requirement, a 10 foot front yard setback, not the 20 feet. And that's a small point, but they sort of behaved like the minor mod was freely given to them from the outset. Um, anyway, I, I will defer to others and uh, come back if I have other thoughts. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Vice Chair Mazza. Yeah, I agree with you, Craig. This is a very well-designed project. Um, what should happen in Malibu? I have a couple questions on on um, your compliance table. It, it says it appears to say that the Tea house is 28 feet high and it's going to move to 10 point feet one inch. I think that's incorrect unless I'm reading it wrong. Um, I think it's doesn't change. Is that correct? Yeah, All right, it's a single family residence, 28 feet, tea house, 28 feet. Uh, thank you for a comment. Yes, and I can defer to the African on that, but my understanding is that we'll be doing the remodel. The single family residence will um, comply at 20, is required to be 28 feet 
but it will be 21 feet. But I can defer to the applicant if well, there's clarification on that. I, I'm really looking at the tea house. Because if you take 18 feet off the tea house, it's definitely not a remodel. Um, the, tea, the tea house is not a tall, it's it's a one story little sort of shack. I know, it appears to be in the pictures, but it says it's 28 feet tall. I'm just wondering it's if not. that's there. That, that's allowed. That's not what's there. That's allowed if you read the column headings. There are no column headings. On the no, previous the page, there are. Page. Okay. Um, <clears throat> there is, what is the, Side yard setback, the view corridor, it's all on the uh, south side of the house, correct? And is it is it two feet or is it six feet? My apologies, Commissioner. Uh, would you be able to repeat the question again? Well, I'm wondering what the view corridor side yard setback is. Um, it says it's, well, it says again, allowed six feet up to, and then it says six foot 10. What, what is the requirement for the side yard setback? Uh, so my understanding is that it's six feet, however, they're non-conforming, so there will be no change. So and essentially. What is, what is it now? It's up to six feet, 10 inches. Okay, but no change. It's not, is it six feet, 10 inches now? That is correct. Okay, so that's going to remain. Okay, it, it appears to me when you look at the landscape plan, there's planters all along that side. The plants are going to be in, and plus trees and um, other blockages. So has anybody evaluated whether those are compliant with that view corridor? Uh, yes, uh, on the analysis, it does not look like the landscaping would pose an issue for obstruction of views. Um, and we did not receive public comment or concern in regards to that either. Well, can you explain why it wouldn't if there's a series of planters all the way to the ocean and, and trees? And uh, why why would you put planters in a, in a view corridor? Obviously, you put plants in planters. Is there any restriction on how, how high the plants can be? Mr. Schmitz covered that issue. Maybe you should ask him. Okay, Mr. John. Uh, uh, his, whoever's Mr. Lowe. Mr. Lowe. Can we unlike Mr. DeLowe, please? Can you hear me? Yes, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, we're the there's existing trees. There's a melaleuca and some other existing vegetation along the western property line. We are not proposing any new vegetation along that line. No new development in the view corridor, uh, except for low lying shrub, uh, possibly, but but nothing significant. Well, it seems to be on GO.20, there's some kind of hedge that blocks the whole corridor. Is that correct? Or there's a hedge along, there's a, a wall covered in 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 you know. Uh, ivy along the uh, the eastern property line or the western property, but there's nothing new that we're proposing in the view corridor. Okay, let me make it plainer. Can you see the ocean down the view mm -hmm. corridor? When viewed from where? From the street. No, you cannot. From, from the from the front of the house, I guess I should say. No, because the guest house is blocking it, and so is the tea house. No, I'm talking the other side. It's the the corridor is on the. No. It's, it's on the western side, John. Not not the eastern side. You're looking at the eastern side. Uh, the western yes. side has a house right up to the. Uh, I interject here, John. There's no view corridor at all. Then. John, there is no. You cannot see the ocean through this house at all. But what yeah, I'm is existing is on, it's on the western side, and there's a building right there. Correct. You okay. cannot see through the building. The building completely blocks the view. You will not be right. able to see the ocean. So why did why did we say that it's on the western side instead of the eastern side when the western when the eastern side does have the potential of the view corridor? Why did we pick that's the side that doesn't have any potential versus one that does? 
I, I, Mr. DeLo, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say that there is no potential. There's no view on any part of the frontage, but uh, the applicant is generally allowed to choose the side that they want for their view corridor. Um, the view corridor is not going to really be an issue until sometime in the in the far future when this building is ultimately torn down uh, and the tea house is torn down, and then you actually have views to the ocean and the view corridor becomes germane. But until such time, it, it, it's really uh, it's a sort of an act of futility. Um, w w you know, this code won't let you approve new development in the view corridor, but you don't really have a view corridor. Okay. Um seems to me you'd set that when you tear it down but uh now can we put up a, the, your picture of the front of the house as it's going to be developed it's got a uh, some kind of glass door and wall and uh it's about halfway through your slides or towards the end sure i think that rendering is used a couple times so yeah there is an existing breezeway there, Commissioner Mazza, with with a door. That's how you access the interior courtyard. Right. What I'm wondering about is it appears that the stone wall that has the numbers on it exceeds six feet uh, and is rather wide. And doesn't that violate your fence, your your six foot requirement? Well, that's why we're requesting a yard uh, a yard mod, Commissioner Mazza, because you're not allowed to have a fence exceeding 42, uh, six feet in the front yard with view permeable above 42 inches. Uh, in order to have a, uh, I can't remember the exact height of the wall. I, I think the wall is somewhere in the eight to 10 foot high range. Uh, in order to have a wall that high, it has to be outside of the yard. And and obviously we're trying to provide some privacy here uh, to the to the owner and some security. So your reason for a minor mod is to be able to put up a ten foot wall. Well, it's it's a it's a site wall. Um, it is uh, it's part of the architectural design. It's part of the design motif. It also provides privacy. It's not across the entire property. It's just in in, in maybe across less than half of the uh, of the the elevation. Yeah, the it's reason I'm asking, I, I've never seen a minor mod so you could block, so you could uh, get around the the uh, requirement that front and side walls should not be more than six feet or 42 inches. Uh, can you, can, is, is Alex, can you put that picture up or um, is it possible or we don't have the technical ability to do that? Well, we're trying to do that. Is this picture in one of your presentations or is this a yeah, different? John Schmitz is, uh, it's in our presentation. Do you have a slide number? Uh, it would be it would be probably a few slides before the end. It's it's going to be uh uh the, the, the view of the house. There you from go, the right there. That yeah. one. So you can see that's a small area, Commissioner Maza. I mean, that's it, it's it's just there as as an architectural element to set everything off, and also to provide privacy. You have that, uh, uh, and the gate is functional. Obviously, it lets cars in and out to go to the garages, and it encloses the parking area um, for the two unenclosed spaces that are required. Well, that's that's what I'm wondering. There are no two unenclosed spaces available when you put in the the minor mod. No, no, no. You you've still got more than twenty feet for for your uh, your space there. According to what what you showed us, uh, it was down to uh, eight feet. It's no, 20, no, no, twenty five feet. Well, yeah. you look at you look at uh, geo. The spaces you have really those comparisons that you showed us. It was much less than 18 feet, which means your cars would stick out in the street. What are the no, <laughs> you're moving it back 10 feet? Well, you can laugh, Jeff, but parking in Malibu counts, and it's a requirement of building. 
I was John, laughing about I was laughing about the street. There's quite a setback off of the from the pavement to the property line. But John, you, you've got 10 feet to the gate, but then from the gate to the actual guest house, you've got like 25 feet. So you that's where you park your cars, is between the gate and the guest house. It's an enclosed area where the cars park. Okay, well that's why I'm wondering on the the reason I'm asking it is because the the uh, parking spaces are listed as uh, two allowed, two proposed. It should be four, 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 uh, four required, not two. Right, there's two enclosed, two unenclosed. Yeah, two in the garage and two two outside the garage. It doesn't say that though. That's why I'm wondering about the compliance table. Uh, it should be two and four, but okay. I understand what you're doing. Um, now, question of uh, our planner is, this house supposedly was built in, uh, what, 23 or 27. Uh, but it doesn't say when the walls were built. These are nine foot walls on both sides. Um, I doubt in 1927, they built nine foot walls between houses in Malibu. Uh, <laughs> Is there any history of any permits for those walls? Are we just saying, well, they're there? Uh, no, unfortunately, what we are looking at is the scope of work that is being proposed currently. So for bringing the entire site into conformance, if items were modified that were unpermitted, they would be subject to um, coming into compliance. So in some cases, not all features of the site can be verified if they have received permits. However, if they're in our scope currently, they would be subject to conformance or the minor mod. So at, at this time, the proposed project would be able to move forward because we've been able to identify that it would either be non-conforming because of the previous permit. But uh, I can verify all structures on site if they are not in the uh, proposed project um, and if they receive permits for those at, at any time. So there's no, we don't know if they were ever permitted or whether they were built after 76 or 2002. We have no evidence? Not all structures at this time on the site were verified, but if they were proposed part of this project and they were verified, if they um, were allowed to remain as not conforming. Okay, and the 10 foot allowance for the front front uh, is somewhere in our code we can have 10 foot walls. Minor things we're allowing for the minor modifications will allow for that wall to exceed the height requirement um, in that setback. Is that allowed, Richard? I'm looking for the code section now, but I believe it's up to, um, up to a 12 foot freestanding wall higher than that it has to be part of the structure it's in the paragraph following the height of fences and walls um, I want to say 12 feet is the max freestanding it, it, the, the goal is not to get 18 foot spike walls isn't the setback like a 20 percent past the right of way or 22 percent and then you're allowed to go a little bit higher like what they're proposing here there's a percentage that that you're allowed to, like if you're building a gate, instead of coming out towards your right of way to open up your gates, if you st step back 22%, which could be whatever, whatever the depth of you're working with. But anyway, I've, I've done it. There's a, there's a code where you can go a little bit higher on the- Yeah, that's true. Gate. That's what I'm asking about. This doesn't appear to be, it's a 10 foot change. It doesn't appear to be 20% of the length of the property. The property is very long. And that's why I'm wondering, I, I know why they're doing it. They don't want anybody to look at their house, but is it kosher? So the front yard setback uh, with beachfront, uh, I want to say is no more than 20 feet, if I'm correct. Uh, but the section of the code you're looking at is 3.5.3.5.3 a... Oh, I just had it. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, 
it oh geez i found 12 feet in there i'm sorry <laughs> um but that's outside of the front yard setback right right and so the idea here is that they've requested <laughs> the minor modification to move the setback uh so that they could allow move it up uh, reduce the setback so that they could then ask for uh, this particular fence and being a uh, a beachfront lot the front yard setback is a maximum of 20 feet or uh, the average of the immediate neighbors and so uh, john am i i don't want to misspeak here but if i'm i want to misread this but i believe we're doing a uh, a 50 percent reduction correct that's correct and that would take it to less than 20 feet or more than 20 feet so i apologize what i'm noticing here is i do realize in our report we said 20 percent or 65 feet whatever is less right. um, that's actually a standard for non-beachfront requirements uh, per the lip Beachfront, and this is LIP 3.6 G1 uh, front, 20 feet maximum or the average of the two immediate neighbors. So 20 feet is the max, and they processed a 50% reduction to reduce it to 10 feet. Okay, I got you. Um, now, my last question, because I have really no problems with this house, is a general one when I know the city has adopted the FEMA map when does it start being used the latest one because we always get seven or eight or nine years ago and there's one that was just adopted within the last six months by the city council um, at one point do people have to follow the new FEMA maps so it it depends um, it, it depends on when the project was under the review of that department uh, this is something i feel like we had this discussion a couple of years back about uh wave uprush uh, and, and i think trevor at that time was sitting in pat's seat and trevor explained that if somebody were to be deemed complete uh, by the the reviewer, then they were essentially complete under those rules and could move forward to getting their CDP. Uh, we would not send them back through the process because uh, the review, uh, the reviewing standards had recently changed. Uh, there Do you know when this was deemed complete? So the Public Works Department looked at it. And this is something we wrestle with is the, the agency and the city deeming it complete versus the planning department waiting for all items. This was reviewed and deemed complete for purposes of public works who and they look at FEMA in 2021. So definitely the folks, the public work engineers that look at this today uh, would be using the most latest information. And so, it, however, uh that's our practice if the commission has a concern about it and wants it to go back to those agencies we, we could do that if there's a majority vote for that well i'm just trying to determine for the future public works usually handle streets um <clears throat> does it have to be particular on an application or they just go down the street one day and say oh this street's okay it's deemed complete and then it goes on forever. Well, was this application actually filed and under review by all the departments. Was the file deemed complete? John, do you have the our complete date handy? Yes. Um, so I actually deemed the project complete in 2023. The project's timeline was a little unusual. It was um, previously approved as stated before by other reviewers in 2021, um, but due to processing internally with the city and um, uh, planning staff coming on board, there was some delay in um, 
reallocating this project to planning staff. And when it was uh, reallocated, it was deemed complete in 2023. Um, so unfortunately, the, the timeline is a little off due to some changes in staffing. Okay, well, this is a remodel. I don't think it really counts, but could you, Richard, at some point come back and tell us um, what we when we start looking at these new FEMA numbers? Uh, I don't know when the city council approved them and what date deemed complete lines up with that, uh, because we're going to start getting them, um, and we need to know that that date. Um, if you would, uh, it's just a request. Understand. Or, or put in the staff report that the deemed complete date is so and so or whatever. Uh, okay, Vice Chair, you got you good. Yeah, and uh, if there's an, are uh, you have more questions, Craig? I do, but uh, Jeff had his hand up first. Yeah. Commissioner Jennings. Yes. Um, Malibu Municipal Code 17.70.030 is that notorious demolition provision that says that you can't demolish uh, a home without having submitted a complete application to build a new home. Uh, and I'm curious, Richard, do you know whether there is a corresponding provision in the LIP or not? I couldn't find it, but I thought maybe you would know. My inclination is to tell you no, uh, and the reason why I say that is that uh, for 20 years we've been making findings under the municipal code for that section. Um, I so yeah. I don't believe there is a, a correlated a, something correlating to that in the LIP. Thank you, uh, and John, um, I'm still struggling with uh, uh, what is it finding or condition um, number 21. Um, the Condition 21, you replaced it, and I'm hoping that what you're going to tell me, I, I, I don't have in my mind what you replaced it with, but Condition 21 refers to LIP, well, it's a couple of problems, but it refers to Section 6.5E1E, and there isn't such a provision, uh, and the what it should be looking at, th th those provisions in, in that section, those are the ones that talk about where Malibu Road is 30 feet or above where the houses are going to be built, and you can't build anything above Malibu Road and all of that. There's uh, 6.5 E2 talks about the situation where we have, like we have here, where the, the road is, is level. I mean, it's, the houses are going to be built at the road level. And that's the one that talks about having to put in a view corridor and all the rest of that stuff. So I, I, if you can put up for me the proposed change that you're making in 21, I'd just like to take a brief look at that to see whether you've solved my problem. Um, yes, I think it, it is in the presentation slide if that can um, be. Um, can we put back up for you by staff? Uh, it should be updated condition number 21 as the header. And um, it does it does have some minor changes to it. Would you like me to go ahead and read back that slide? If oh, it looks like it's available. No, I well, I can just yeah. see in the first line that it changes the reference. From 6.5 E1 E to 6.5 E2 E, and that's good. I, I think what you've done is you've changed it to the appropriate section there. So you've satisfied my concern. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Commissioner. Great. Uh, and I have no other comments, so I will move staff recommendation. I will second that. Well, great. I guess Commissioner Hill, probably for further discussion for a moment. Yeah, just a little bit more. Um, just anecdotally, uh, I, I think the new FEMA that just came into effect actually would cut them a little bit of slack because they came out, it wasn't the 2016 that the city appealed and, and they came back with. No, no it was the 18. No? Oh, it was the 18. Okay. Well, all right. Never mind that. I'm just wondering if there's something creative and helpful we could do about 
the coastal engineering says that the tea house may be subject to hydrodynamic forces from the full height of the wave bore moving across the deck after overtopping. And um, so some of that could be washed out to sea. I just wonder if there's any helpful condition we could put in about how long the tea house stays there linked to how long the bulkhead is there or something that says that, that basically we're not going to let this tea house just get washed away in a storm and broken up and all the pieces go out to sea, but that at a certain point when a certain thing happens, um, we decide, you know what, it's time to dismantle the tea house. Is there something we can do that makes sense there or are we just kind of going to let it be an accident that eventually happens? Mr. Hill, did you go in that courtyard where the tea house is? I did. Okay, so there's there's a five foot wall or it can be hard to get to that thing and have it wash out to the sea. I'm not saying that that can't happen, but it's, I don't see it happening. Well, uh, two things. One, coastal engineering said that's a possibility. And two, my look at the bulkhead says this is not going to last forever. They, they might have 20 years before they, you know. So it's just, is there, I mean, if there's nothing smart we can do, then fine. But if there's something that would make sense, I'm just bringing it up. Maybe somebody has a clever idea. I don't, I don't. I don't see it right now, but uh, okay, uh, Vice Chair Mazza, and then we'll take a vote here. Um, I would be amenable to, on my second, to require uh, engineering to strap it to the uh, to the bulkhead. I mean, to the deck instead of just nailing it, because um, you certainly don't. When we had the uh, storms in '83, we lost about twelve houses in the. Paradise Cove, Latigo area by houses bouncing down the beach and bashing down houses and the pilings underneath them when they got wiped out. And at least if you strap it down, it'll be a big pile of mush somewhere, but it won't be out to sea. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an easy fix. Uh, you know, it's not like you're asking him to put in foundations under it or anything else. So... Vice Chair, when I looked at this and the the, how many structural pages there are in this plan set, I think they're pretty good. I, I would point out it. where the hot tea house will not is, is strapped down to. I don't any think anything I, on the oceans a, a million percent safe at any time, but I believe right now that that little building is going to be okay. But well, for, I, what it's, I, for what I, it's I, worth, I, John, I'm, for what it's worth, I'm not going to accept it because. Unlike a lot of the people, I have no construction background. I don't know whether this would be a good thing or a bad thing, uh, whether you use nails or screws or silly putty to hold it down. <laughs> I don't have that experience. And we have you. two experts on the on the And neither do you. And so the, I'm not going to accept your recommendation. Okay. Well, when the next door neighbor's house gets bashed down. Send, give them my card. Them. I'll sue yeah. for them. Yeah. 10-4. Okay, um, I think we're in good shape here. Uh, Rebecca, can we take a vote, please? For the approval of the project per staff recommendation. Commissioner Jennings? Yes. Vice Chair Mazza? Yes. Commissioner Hill? Yes. Commissioner Peake? I didn't think I'd ever see this. I <laughs> <know>. <laughs> Yeah, let's start over. Can we take a vote? <laughs> oh, wait, I'm I sorry. Have, I must have dozed off or something. And I say yes as well. Thank you. Motion carries. Okay, so we have, we don't have any old business, but new business. We've got recommended action, receive an update in an enclosed space at Howdy's. Um, you know, I ate there the other day. It was really wonderful. Um, I'm not sure what we're doing here. Why, why are we beating people up? What's what's the scoop here? Who who do we have? You want an answer to that? Because we want to see. No, I'm going to let. Code. I'm going to let. I'm going to let staff. Tell that me. is irrelevant, by the way. I'm going to let staff tell me first, vice chair, and then we'll see what happens after that. So, who do we have here for for this? Oh well, it was it was senior planner Bobbitt. So it must you be. you have planning director Malika for this presentation. Is he up to it? Can we? Is he okay with this? Sure, I'll be glad to <laughs> do this. I'm feeling um, a little bit of the burrito police. 
<laughs> Finally, have the next slide, please. So there was a question of whether or not Howdy's enclosed their patio area. And after, so uh, if this was done, my understanding was specifically that was a subsequent approval that is given that increased the the amount of floor area of the buildings. And so what you have in this particular slide is a, a copy of the over-the-counter application that was uh, presented uh, to the Planning Commission to allow for uh, basically a, a glass windows, walls, fencing, however you want to look at it, but the idea was a, a windbreak so that the patio at Howdy's would not become a wind tunnel. And the, uh, the glass that was added was added within an existing opening the glass panes that were put in, and then there is a space above them that is open to light and air. And that's also identified in the middle, uh, top row, middle elevation. If I may have the next slide, please. This is a uh, some further details, more of a close-up showing the areas where the windscreen was allowed and providing with the de uh, the uh, calculations. And in here, uh, highlighted in red, are the calculations for each of the uh, elevations to demonstrate that it did not uh, go beyond the allowable percentage for an enclosure. And so this is like a surface area square footage calculation. If I may have the next slide, please. Uh, in 2022, a covering was approved to be placed over this patio area. So it had a trellis type roof and they were looking for something that would provide shade. And the concern would be that this awning now would fully enclose the area. Uh, what we have here is a copy of the cover sheet of the plans uh, along with the, the technical data of the material. If I may have the next slide, please. So the material that was put in there, there was a question of whether or not it created a, an enclosure, if it was solid. Uh, the building official did review this, and it was her determination that this material did not create a solid enclosure. Uh, these photographs you have here uh, are, were taken during the rains that we had uh, in March. And what you could see is that the, the, the awning it is a permeable surface in that it does let rainwater come through. And the complaint that we heard from the, the, the property, or excuse me, the tenant, uh, this could be the burrito police comment, uh, was that there were a lot of soggy food, uh, burritos, and therefore the, the enclosure actually, they were, or the, the cover, was frustrating people and, and there was a loss of business because you, that was their only seating area and, and folks were outside in the rain and uh, it just was not conducive. If I may have the next slide, please. Is that, there we go. And there is another one. So what you can see in this picture is you see the glass and then you see the open space there. Um, yeah, you got those patio heaters there for reference and then you see the bar, that area there is open uh, in the to wind and the elements. Next slide, please. And these are some additional photos showing the area. So you can see the enclosures, uh, the, the window windscreen uh, material uh, on the right-hand side there and left is a picture taken from the outside. And then also we have a view of the cover uh, that was placed on top. Next slide, please. And I think that takes us to the end, correct, Rebecca? I believe that is the final slide. Yeah, the last one there. 
So I, I hope this information helps to answer the questions that were brought up by this commission. Uh, as I mentioned, we did take the care to have the building official look at this, uh, looked at the definition of what is considered uh, enclosed space and what is floor area uh, to make certain that the, the two actions, the two over the counters there did not result in an expansion of the floor area and, and maintained an outdoor patio. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Um, disclosures, Commissioner Jennings. There's nothing in front of us. Oh yeah, this is received. <laughs> Sorry, you're right. Commissioner. Hey, Bree, over there. I move we adjourn. A second. I have questions. I have questions too. Of course. My hand is up. It is. Go ahead. Right. Yeah, I, I went by the site and looked at it again. Um, I don't buy that the ceiling is not an enclosed, and those walls that we just saw, those per windows are permanent. The only part that is open on each of those walls is a, is the 18 inch portion at the top, which is it's sort of like a a clear story, except it's not glass. It's it's an 18 inch wide airspace above the top. So we basically, if you add up the surfaces and what is enclosed and what is not enclosed, and you count the roof as an enclosure because it's it looks like a solid roof, you've got about 20% of surface area that's not enclosed. In other words, 80% of it is enclosed. The LIP definition says uh, building enclosed a structure which is not open to the air for more than 40% of its surface. And it, so to me, it's just really clear. And the significance of this is that as an enclosed space, it overtops the site's FAR. So I, I don't know, I don't know how the building official can look at a closed permanent window and say it's not enclosed. I mean, when you when you frame your house and you've got big, you know, picture windows looking that don't open, that's a, you could treat that as a solid wall. You count the space inside that as TDSF, for example. So, what it, I guess I would ask the question: What is the rationale for saying a big window that's virtually all solid glass counts as open, open, unenclosed area? So I forget the slide number, but th that was the purpose of the second page there, if you will, of the 2019 approval, was that the planning director at the time requested uh, essentially the square footage, or I guess better, probably a better way to explain it would be the surface area of that particular wall, and making certain that with the inclu inclusion of the glass, that it did not result in more than a 60% enclosure. And so that was the reason for those, the, I, I will, I'll call it the clear story because I, I believe you and I, if I say that we're talking about the same thing. Yeah. The, the, the clear story area was open to light and air so that it would not uh, result in more than a 60% enclosure. So that, that is why the, the previous director requested those um, calculations be placed on the the particular plan to demonstrate that. Well, that the clear story can't be more than ten percent of each individual wall that they're set into, uh, and you know those walls are really tall, and so then we basically have those, and we've got one side, and then that corner, actually not even the whole side, part of one side and the corner are open. It it adds up to roughly twenty percent. That's in my you know, back of the envelope, look, it just doesn't seem close. So I, I, the, the real question is, how does a big giant picture window get called not enclosed? You're saying she didn't do that, that somehow the, the she found the open space somewhere else? Based on the calculations on the plans, those calculations presented that it did not result in more than a 40% excuse me, more than a 60% enclosure. It maintained 40% open. Okay. Uh, that, that, that's what those calculations demonstrate. And the director at the time who reviewed it believed it to be consistent. 
Well, we don't have anything to vote on here. And I, I mean, I guess the, the only remedy would be some kind of code violation. And apparently nobody who is in a position of authority thinks there's a violation. So I don't know. I don't know. At a certain point, Jeff's right. Like, where do we go from here? Nowhere, maybe. What, John, maybe John has a comment. Well, it seems to me that oh, the question I have is, what is the number? Craig, Craig's talking 20, you're talking 60. What is the requirement in the code? Is it 60? The code says or 40. 40? Yeah. Well, it's. And he's talking 60 as the other side of that 40. Oh, yeah, okay. I'm looking actually now. There's a definition. Um, it's building comma enclosed, I think. Let me yeah, I, I just I just quoted it a second ago. Here uh, you go. Building enclosed means a structure which is not open to the air for more than 40% of its surface. So 40% uh, of, of the wall needs to be open and then 60% could be solid if we, yeah. so it, 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 I think Craig, correct me if I'm wrong here, it's getting late at night, but if we said that the number came out to 35%, that would make it 65% and therefore it's enclosed, correct? But no, it would have to be 40% open um, maximum. That's what he just said. Oh. Yeah, yeah, so if the 40 became smaller, so 35, okay. 25, then we would be in, it would be an enclosed building. Okay. Uh, let me yes, that would be, you are correct, Richard. That is correct. Not yeah. open to more than 40%. Okay, I am assuming that you're counting in that 40% the roof. Which leaks. Well, that's, it's supposed to leak if you, you don't, if you count it. So, uh, yes. I believe okay. that is correct. From what I could ascertain of how the numbers were done, they were done on a per wall basis. So they looked to make certain that the, the wall did not become an enclosed wall, because uh, that would be representative of, of the project. And yes, the assumption is that the roof remains open to light and air uh, hence the reason why the, the cover is permeable and the the rainwater coming through it uh, you know, supports the determination that that material would not meet the building code's definition of something that would be uh, make it enclosed, meaning that the elements are prevented from coming. So through. if they came in later and put up a, a tin roof or something, then they, they violated its TDSL. That would definitely be a problem. Uh, because now we've got a roof on there. Uh, I'm not confident. Uh, then we definitely need to look at those numbers again, because I, I believe that that would create an issue because it, it at that point, it is a solid roof. Um, yeah, to, fo to focus this, it really comes down to, is the roof open to the air or not? Because that's that's the big, definitionally, if that's open, then, you, then you're good. But it's, it's open sure to looks the rain. Like the rain just comes pours right in, so it's open to all those things. But, but does, when you look in there, it doesn't appear to be open to air. But but it is. You saw the pictures of everything wet, and it chases all the customers out. So it's kind of a it's a trade off. Okay, so you've got a windbreak, but your roof leaks. Take your pick. You also have an area of eighteen inches where the wind can blow the rain in too. But again. <laughs> You got to, it, it is an over the, it's an over the counter permit. And right now they've got the backup. If it changes, it changes. If it does, somebody will probably see it. Or if there's other buildings in town, I've noticed that we have approved outside seating in certain of these shopping centers where there's no way they're outside anymore, but that's a different subject. Okay, we have so, a motion. We have a oh, hang on, uh, Chair Smith. It, it, Chair Smith, it, it is its own independent item. We do need to see if there's any public comment on it. Oh, okay. Uh, Rebecca, do we have an, anyone that wants to speak? If there is anyone remaining in the meeting who would like to speak on this item and has not signed up to do so, please click the raise hand button now. Which is basically Norman Doug. 
<laughs> seeing yeah, none. I, I move we adjourn. I move we adjourn. I second it. Which we already did, but that's take a vote and let's go. Um, so previously, Commissioner Jennings and Peak had moved this. Commissioner Jennings. Yes. Commissioner Peak. Good night. Commissioner Hill. I move we go for tacos. Yeah, yes. <laughs> you can't find a place open. Vice Chair Mazza. Yes. Chair Smith. Yes. 